My Man Jeeves by P. G. Wodehouse. One, leave it to Jeeves. Jeeves, my man, you know, is really a most extraordinary chap. So capable. Honestly, I shouldn't know what to do without him. On broader lines, he's like those chappies who sit peering sadly over the marble battlements at the Pennsylvania Station, in the place marked Inquiries. You know the Johnnies, I mean. You go up to them and say, When's the next train for Mellon Squashville, Tennessee? And they reply, without stopping to think, 243, track 10, change at San Francisco. And they're right every time. Well, Jeeves gives you just the same impression of omniscience. As an instance of what I mean, I remember meeting Monty Bing in Bond Street one morning, looking the last word in a gray check suit, and I felt I should never be happy till I had one like it. I dug the address of the tailors out of him, and had them working on the thing inside the hour. "'Jeeves,' I said that evening, "'I'm getting a check suit, like that one of Mr. Bing's.' "'Injudicious, sir,' he said firmly. "'It will not become you.' "'What absolute rot! It's the soundest thing I've struck for years.' "'Unsuitable for you, sir.' Well, the long and the short of it was that the confounded thing came home and I put it on, and when I caught sight of myself in the glass I nearly swooned. Jeeves was perfectly right. I looked across between a music-hall comedian and a cheap bookie. Yet Monty had looked fine in absolutely the same stuff. These things are just life's mysteries, and that's all there is to it. But it isn't only that Jeeves' judgment about clothes is infallible— though, of course, that's really the main thing. The man knows everything. There was the matter of that tip on the Lincolnshire. I forgot now how I got it, but it had the aspect of being the real red-hot Tabasco. Jeeves, I said, for I'm fond of the man, and I like to do him a good turn when I can. If you want to make a bit of money, have something on Wonder Child for the Lincolnshire. He shook his head. I'd rather not, sir. But it's the straight goods. I'm going to put my shirt on him. I do not recommend it, sir. The animal is not intended to win. Second place is what the stable is after. Perfect piffle, I thought, of course. How the deuce could Jeeves know anything about it? Still, you know what happened. Wonder Child led till he was breathing on the wire— and then Banana Fritter came along and nosed him out. I went straight home and rang for Jeeves. After this, I said, not another step for me without your advice. From now on, consider yourself the brains of the establishment. Very good, sir. I shall endeavor to give satisfaction. And he has, by Jove. I'm a bit short on brain myself. The old bean would appear to have been constructed more for ornament than for use, don't you know? But give me five minutes to talk the thing over with Jeeves, and I'm game to advise anyone about anything. And that's why, when Bruce Corcoran came to me with his troubles, my first act was to ring the bell and put it up to the lad with the bulging forehead. Leave it to Jeeves, I said. I first got to know Corky when I came to New York. He was a pal of my cousin Gussie, who was in with a lot of people down Washington Square way. I don't know if I ever told you about it, but the reason why I left England was because I was sent over by my Aunt Agatha to try and stop young Gussie marrying a girl on the vaudeville stage, and I got the whole thing so mixed up that I decided that it would be a sound scheme for me to stop on in America for a bit instead of going back and having long cozy chats about the thing with Aunt. So I sent Jeeves out to find a decent apartment, and settled down for a bit of exile. I'm bound to say that New York's a topping place to be exiled in. Everybody was awfully good to me, and there seemed to be plenty of things going on, and I'm a wealthy bird, so everything was fine. Chappies introduced me to other chappies, and so on and so forth, and it wasn't long before I knew squads of the right sort, some who rolled in dollars in houses up by the park, and others who lived with the gas turned down 
mostly around Washington Square. Artists and writers and so forth. Brainy coves. Corky was one of the artists. A portrait painter, he called himself, but he hadn't painted any portraits. He was sitting on the sidelines with a blanket over his shoulders, waiting for a chance to get in the game. You see, the catch about portrait painting, I've looked into the thing a bit, is that you can't start painting portraits till people come along and ask you to, and they won't come and ask you until you've painted a lot first. This makes it kind of difficult for a chappie. Corky managed to get along by drawing an occasional picture for the comic papers. He had a rather gift for the funny stuff when he got a good idea, and doing bedsteads and chairs and things for the advertisements. His principal source of income, however, was derived from biting the ear of a rich uncle, one Alexander Warple, who was in the jute business. I'm a bit foggy as to what jute is, but it's apparently something the populace is pretty keen on, for Mr. Warple had made quite an indecently large stack out of it. Now, a great many fellows think that having a rich uncle is a pretty soft snap, but, according to Corky, such is not the case. Corky's uncle was a robust sort of cove who looked like living forever. He was fifty-one, but it seemed as if he might go to par. It was not this, however, that distressed poor old Corky, for he was not bigoted, and had no objection to the man going on living. What Corky kicked at was the way the above Warple used to harry him. Corky's uncle, you see, didn't want him to be an artist. He didn't think he had any talent in that direction. He was always urging him to chuck art and go into the jute business, and start at the bottom and work his way up. Jute had apparently become a sort of obsession with him. He seemed to attach an almost spiritual importance to it. And what Corky said was that, while he didn't know what they did at the bottom of the jute business, instinct told him it was something too beastly for words. Corky, moreover, believed in his future as an artist. Some day, he said, he was going to make a hit. Meanwhile, by using the utmost tact and persuasiveness, he was inducing his uncle to cough up very grudgingly a small quarterly allowance. He wouldn't have gotten this if his uncle hadn't had a hobby. Mr. Warple was peculiar in this respect. As a rule, from what I've observed, the American captain of industry doesn't do anything out of business hours. When he has put the cat out and locked up the office for the night, he just relapses into a state of coma from which he emerges only to start being a captain of industry again. But Mr. Warple in his spare time was what is known as an ornithologist. He had written a book called American Birds, and was writing another, to be called More American Birds. When he'd finished that, the presumption was that he would begin a third, and keep on till the supply of American birds gave out. Corky used to go to him about once every three months, and let him talk about American birds. Apparently, you could do what you liked with old Warple if you gave him his head first on his pet subject, so these little chats used to make Corky's allowance all right for the time being. But it was pretty rotten for the poor chap. There was the frightful suspense, you see, and, apart from that, birds, except when broiled and in the society of a cold bottle, bored him stiff. To complete the character study of Mr. Warple, he was a man of extremely uncertain temper, and his general tendency was to think that Corky was a poor chump, and that whatever step he took in any direction on his own account was just another proof of his innate idiocy. I should imagine Jeeves feels very much the same about me. So when Corky trickled into my apartment one afternoon, shooing in a girl in front of him, and said, Bertie, I want you to meet my fiancée, Miss Singer. The aspect of the matter which hit me first was precisely the one which he had come to consult me about. The very first words I spoke were, Corky, what about your uncle? The poor chap gave one of those mirthless laughs. He was looking anxious and worried, like a man who has done the murder all right, but can't think what the deuce to do with the body. "'We're so scared, Mr. Wooster,' said the girl. "'We were hoping that you might suggest a way of breaking it to him.' Muriel Singer was one of those very quiet, appealing girls, who gave a way of looking at you with their big eyes, as if they thought you were the greatest thing on earth, 
and wondered that you hadn't got on to it yet yourself. She sat there in a sort of shrinking way, looking at me as if she were saying to herself, Oh, I do hope this great strong man isn't going to hurt me. She gave a fellow a protective kind of feeling, made him want to stroke her hand and say, There, there, little one, or words to that effect. She made me feel that there was nothing I wouldn't do for her. She was rather like one of those innocent-tasting American drinks, which creep imperceptibly into your system so that, before you know what you're doing, you're starting out to reform the world by force if necessary, and pausing on your way to tell the large man in the corner that, if he looks at you like that, you will knock his head off. What I mean is, she made me feel alert and dashing, like a jolly old knight-errant or something of that kind. I felt that I was with her in this thing to the limit. "'I don't see why your uncle shouldn't be most awfully bucked,' I said to Corky. "'He will think Miss Singer is the ideal wife for you.' Corky declined to cheer up. "'You don't know him. Even if he did like Muriel, he wouldn't admit it. That's the sort of pig-headed guy he is. It would be a matter of principle with him to kick.' All he would consider would be that I had gone and taken an important step without asking his advice, and he would raise Cain automatically. He's always done it. I strained the old bean to meet this emergency. You want to work it so that he makes Miss Singer's acquaintance without knowing that you know her. Then you come along. But how can I work it that way? I saw his point. That was the catch. "'There's only one thing to do,' I said. "'What's that?' "'Leave it to Jeeves.' And I rang the bell. "'Sir,' said Jeeves, kind of manifesting himself. "'One of the rummy things about Jeeves is that, unless you watch like a hawk, you very seldom see him come into a room.' He's like one of those weird chappies in India who dissolve themselves into thin air and nip through space in a sort of disembodied way and assemble the parts again just where they want them. I've got a cousin who's what they call a theosophist, and he says he's often nearly worked the thing himself, but couldn't quite bring it off, probably owing to having fed in his boyhood on the flesh of animals slain in anger and pie. The moment I saw the man standing there, registering respectful attention, a weight seemed to roll off my mind. I felt like a lost child who spots his father in the offing. There was something about him that gave me confidence. Jeeves is a tallish man with one of those dark, shrewd faces. His eye gleams with the light of pure intelligence. Jeeves, we want your advice. Very good, sir. I boiled down Corky's painful case into a few well-chosen words. So you see what it amount to, Jeeves. We want you to suggest some way by which Mr. Warple can make Miss Singer's acquaintance without getting on to the fact that Mr. Corcoran already knows her. Understand? Perfectly, sir. Well, try to think of something. I have thought of something already, sir. You have? The scheme I would suggest cannot fail of success, but it has what may seem to you a drawback, sir, in that it requires a certain financial outlay. He means, I translated to Corky, that he has got a pippin of an idea, but it's going to cost a bit. Naturally, the poor chap's face dropped, for this seemed to dish the whole thing. But I was still under the influence of the girl's melting gaze, and I saw that this was where I started in as knight-errant. "'You can count on me for all that sort of thing, Corky,' I said. "'Only too glad. Carry on, Jeeves.' "'I would suggest, sir, that Mr. Corcoran take advantage of Mr. Warple's attachment to ornithology.' "'How on earth did you know that he was fond of birds?' "'It is the way these New York apartments are constructed, sir.' quite unlike our London houses. The partitions between the rooms are of the flimsiest nature. With no wish to overhear, I have sometimes heard Mr. Corcoran expressing himself with a generous strength on the subject I have mentioned. Oh, well? 
why should not the young lady write a small volume, to be entitled, let us say, The Children's Book of American Birds, and dedicate it to Mr. Warple? A limited edition could be published at your expense, sir, and a great deal of the book would, of course, be given over to eulogistic remarks concerning Mr. Warple's own larger treatise on the same subject. I should recommend the dispatching of a presentation copy to Mr. Warple immediately on publication, accompanied by a letter in which the young lady asks to be allowed to make the acquaintance of one to whom she owes so much. This would, I fancy, produce the desired result, but, as I say, the expense involved would be considerable. I felt like the proprietor of a performing dog on the vaudeville stage, when the tyke has just pulled off his trick without a hitch. I had betted on Jeeves all along, and I had known that he wouldn't let me down. It beats me sometimes why a man with his genius is satisfied to hang around pressing my clothes and what not. If I had half Jeeves' brain, I should have a stab at being Prime Minister or something. Jeeves, I said, that is absolutely ripping. One of your very best efforts. Thank you, sir. The girl made an objection. But I'm sure I couldn't write a book about anything. I can't even write good letters. Muriel's talents, said Corky, with a little cough, lie more in the direction of the drama, Bertie. I didn't mention it before, but one of our reasons for being a trifle nervous as to how Uncle Alexander will receive the news is that Muriel is in the chorus of that show, Choose Your Exit, at the Manhattan. It's absurdly unreasonable, but we both feel that that fact might increase Uncle Alexander's natural tendency to kick like a steer. I saw what he meant. Goodness knows there was fuss enough in our family when I tried to marry into musical comedy a few years ago, and the recollection of my Aunt Agatha's attitude in the matter of Gussie and the vaudeville girl was still fresh in my mind. I didn't know why it is. One of these psychology sharps could explain it, I suppose, but uncles and aunts, as a class, are always dead against the drama, legitimate or otherwise. They don't seem able to stick it at any price. But Jeeves had a solution, of course. I fancy it would be a simple matter, sir, to find some impecunious author who would be glad to do the actual composition of the volume for a small fee. It is only necessary that the young lady's name should appear on the title page. That's true, said Corky. Sam Patterson would do it for a hundred dollars. He writes a novelette, three short stories, and ten thousand words of a serial for one of those all-fiction magazines under different names every month. A little thing like this would be nothing to him. I'll get after him right away. Fine. Will that be all, sir? said Jeeves. A very good, sir. Thank you, sir. I always used to think that publishers had to be devilish intelligent fellows, loaded down with the gray matter. But I've got their number now. All a publisher has to do is write checks at intervals, while a lot of deserving and industrious chappies rally round and do the real work. I know, because I've been one myself. I simply sat tight in the old apartment with a fountain pen, and in due season a topping shiny book came along. I happened to be down at Corky's place when the first copies of The Children's Book of American Birds bobbed up. Muriel Singer was there, and we were talking of things in general when there was a bang at the door and the parcel was delivered. It was certainly some book. It had a red cover with a fowl of some species on it, and underneath the girl's name in gold letters. I opened a copy at random. Often of a spring morning, it said at the top of page 21, as you wander through the fields, you will hear the sweet-toned, carelessly flowing warble of the purple finch linnet. When you are older, you must read all about him in Mr. Alexander Warple's wonderful book, American Birds. You see, a boost for the uncle right away. And only a few pages later, there he was in the limelight again, in connection with the yellow-billed cuckoo. It was great stuff. The more I read, the more I admired the chap who had written it, and Jeeves' genius in putting us on to the wheeze. I didn't see how the uncle could fail to drop. 
You can't call a chap the world's greatest authority on the yellow-billed cuckoo without arousing a certain disposition towards chumminess in him. It's a cert, I said. An absolute cinch, said Corky. And a day or two later he meandered up the avenue to my apartment to tell me that all was well. The uncle had written Muriel a letter so dripping with the milk of human kindness that if he hadn't known Mr. Warple's handwriting, Corky would have refused to believe him the author of it. Any time it suited Miss Singer to call, said the uncle, he would be delighted to make her acquaintance. Shortly after this I had to go out of town. Divers Sound sportsmen had invited me to pay visits to their country places, and it wasn't for several months that I settled down in the city again. I had been wondering a lot, of course, about Corky, whether it all turned out all right and so forth, and my first evening in New York happened to pop into a quiet sort of little restaurant which I go to when I don't feel inclined for the bright lights. I found Muriel Singer there, sitting by herself at a table near the door. Corky, I took it, was out telephoning. I went up and passed the time of day. "'Well, well, well, what?' I said. "'Why, Mr. Wooster, how do you do?' Corky around? I beg your pardon? You are waiting for Corky, aren't you? Oh, I didn't understand. No, I'm not waiting for him. It seemed to Ro that there was a sort of something in her voice, a kind of thingummy, you know. I say, you haven't had a row with Corky, have you? A row? A spat, don't you know? Little misunderstanding? Faults on both sides, or and all that sort of thing? Why, whatever makes you think that? Oh, well, as it were, what? What I mean is, I thought you usually dined with him before you went to the theatre. I've left the stage now. Suddenly the whole thing dawned on me. I had forgotten what a long time I had been away. Why, of course, I see now. You're married. Yes. How perfectly topping. I wish you all kinds of happiness. Thank you so much. Oh, Alexander, she said, looking past me. This is a friend of mine, Mr. Wooster. I spun around. A chappy with a lot of stiff gray hair and a red sort of healthy face was standing there. Rather a formidable Johnny, he looked, though quite peaceful at the moment. I want you to meet my husband, Mr. Wooster. Mr. Wooster is a friend of Bruce's, Alexander. The old boy grasped my hand warmly and that was all that kept me from hitting the floor in a heap. The place was rocking, absolutely. "'So you know my nephew, Mr. Wooster,' I heard him say. "'I wish you would try to knock a little sense into him and make him quit this playing at painting. But I have an idea that he is steadying down. I noticed at first that night he came to dinner with us, my dear, to be introduced to you. He seemed altogether quieter and more serious. Something seemed to have sobered him.' Perhaps you will give us the pleasure of your company at dinner tonight, Mr. Wooster, or have you dined? I said I had. What I needed then was air, not dinner. I felt that I wanted to get into the open and think this thing out. When I reached my apartment, I heard Jeeves moving about in his lair. I called him. Jeeves, I said, now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of the party. A stiff B and S, first of all. And then I've got a bit of news for you. He came back with a tray and a long glass. Better have one yourself, Jeeves. You'll need it. Later on, perhaps. Thank you, sir. All right. Please yourself. But you're going to get a shock. You remember my friend, Mr. Corcoran? Yes, sir. And the girl who was to slide gracefully into his uncle's esteem by writing the book on birds? Perfectly, sir. Well, she's slid. She's married the uncle. He took it without blinking. You can't rattle Jeeves. That was always a development to be feared, sir. You don't mean to tell me you were expecting it. It crossed my mind as a possibility. Did it, by Jove. Well, I think you might have warned us. I hardly liked to take the liberty, sir. Of course, as I saw after I had had a bite to eat and was in a calmer frame of mind, what had happened wasn't my fault if it came down to it. I couldn't be expected to foresee that the scheme, in itself a crackerjack, would skid into the ditch as it had done. 
but all the same i am bound to admit that i didn't relish the idea of meeting corky again until time the great healer had been able to get in a bit of soothing work i cut washington square out absolutely for the next few months i gave it the complete miss in balk and then just when i was beginning to think i might safely pop down in that direction and gather up the dropped threads so to speak time instead of working thy healing wheeze went and pulled the most awful bone and put the lid on it opening the paper one morning i read that mrs alexander warple had presented her husband with a son and heir i was so darn sorry for poor old corky that i hadn't the heart to touch my breakfast i told jeeves to drink it himself i was bowled over absolutely it was the limit i hardly knew what to do i wanted of course to rush down to washington square and grip the poor blighter silently by the hand and then thinking it over i hadn't the nerve absent treatment seemed the touch i gave it to him in waves but after a month or so i began to hesitate again it struck me that it was playing it a bit low down on the poor chap avoiding him like this just when he probably wanted his pals to surge round him most i pictured him sitting in his lonely studio with no company but his bitter thoughts and the pathos of it got to me to such an extent that i bounded straight into a taxi and told the driver to go all out for the studio i rushed in and there was corky hunched up at the easel painting away while on the model throne sat a severe-looking woman of middle age holding a baby a fellow has to be ready for that sort of thing oh ah i said and started to back out corky looked over his shoulder hallo bertie don't go we're just finishing for the day that will be all this afternoon he said to the nurse who got up with the baby and decanted it into a perambulator which was standing in the fairway at the same time tomorrow mr corcoran yes please good afternoon good afternoon corky stood there looking at the door and then he turned to me and began to get it off his chest fortunately he seemed to take it for granted that i knew all about what had happened so it wasn't as awkward as it might have been it's my uncle's idea he said muriel doesn't know about it yet the portrait's to be a surprise for her birthday party the nurse takes the kid out ostensibly to get a breather and they beat it down here if you want to get an instance of the irony of fate bertie get acquainted with this here's the first commission i have ever had to paint a portrait and the sitter is that human poached egg that has butted in and bounced me out of my inheritance can you beat it i call it rubbing the thing in to expect me to spend my afternoons gazing into the ugly face of that little brat who to all intents and purposes has hit me behind the ear with a blackjack and swiped all i possess i can't refuse to paint the portrait because if i did my uncle would stop my allowance yet every time i look up and catch that kid's vacant eye i suffer agonies i tell you bertie sometimes when he gives me a patronizing glance and then turns away and is sick as if it revolted him to look at me i come within an ace of occupying the entire front page of the evening papers as the latest murder sensation there are moments when i can almost see the headlines promising young artist beans baby with axe i patted his shoulder silently my sympathy for the poor old scout was too deep for words i kept away from the studio for some time after that because it didn't seem right to me to intrude on the poor chappie's sorrow besides i'm bound to say that nurse intimidated me she reminded me so infernally of aunt agatha she was the same gimlet-eyed type but one afternoon corky called me on the phone bertie hello are you doing anything this afternoon nothing special you couldn't come down here could you what's the trouble anything up i've finished the portrait a good boy stout work yes his voice sounded rather doubtful the fact is bertie it doesn't look quite right to me there's something about it my uncle's coming in half an hour to inspect it and i don't know why it is 
but I kind of feel I'd like your moral support. I began to see that I was letting myself in for something. The sympathetic cooperation of G seemed to me to be indicated. You think you'll cut up rough? He may. I threw my mind back to the red-faced chappy I'd met at the restaurant and tried to picture him cutting up rough. It was only too easy. I spoke to Corky firmly on the telephone. I'll come, I said. Good. But only if I may bring Jeeves. Why Jeeves? What's Jeeves got to do with it? Who wants Jeeves? Jeeves is the fool who suggested the scheme that is led. Listen, Corky, old top. If you think I'm going to face that uncle of yours without Jeeves' support, you're mistaken. I'd sooner go into a den of wild beasts and bite a lion on the back of the neck. Oh, all right, said Corky. Not cordially, but he said it. So I rang for Jeeves and explained the situation. Very good, sir, said Jeeves. That's the sort of chap he is. You can't rattle him. We found Corky near the door looking at the picture, with one hand up in a defensive sort of way, as if he thought it might swing on him. Stand right where you are, Bertie, he said without moving. Now, tell me honestly, how does it strike you? The light from the big window fell right on the picture. I took a good look at it. Then I shifted a bit nearer and took another look. Then I went back to where I'd been at first, because it hadn't seemed quite so bad from there. Well, said Corky anxiously, I hesitated a bit. Of course, old man, I only saw the kid once, and then only for a moment, but, but, it was an ugly sort of kid, wasn't it, if I remember rightly? As ugly as that? I looked again, and honesty compelled me to be frank. I don't see how it could have been, old chap. Poor old Corky ran his fingers through his hair in a temperamental sort of way. He groaned. You're right, Bertie. Something's gone wrong with the darn thing. My private impression is that, without knowing it, I've worked that stunt that Sergeant and those fellows pull, painting the soul of the sitter. I've got through the mere outward appearance, and I've put the child's soul on canvas. But could a child of that age have a soul like that? I don't see how he could have managed it in the time. What do you think, Jeeves? I doubt it, sir. It, it sort of leers at you, doesn't it? You've noticed that, too, said Corky. I don't see how one could help noticing. All I tried to do was give the little brute a cheerful expression. But, as it turned out, he looks positively dissipated. Just what I was going to suggest, old man. He looks as if he were in the middle of a colossal spree, and enjoying every minute of it. Don't you think so, Jeeves? He has a decidedly inebriated air, sir. Corky was starting to say something when the door opened, and the uncle came in. For about three seconds all was joy, jollity, and goodwill. The old boy shook hands with me, slapped Corky on the back, said that he didn't think he had ever seen such a fine day, and whacked his leg with his stick. Jeeves had projected himself into the background, and he didn't notice him. "'Well, Bruce, my boy, so the portrait is finally finished, is it? Really finished. Well, bring it out. Let's have a look at it. This will be a wonderful surprise for your aunt. Well, where is it? Let's—' And then he got it. Suddenly, when he wasn't set for the punch, and he rocked back on his heels. "'Oosh!' he exclaimed. And for perhaps a minute there was one of the scaliest silences I have ever run up against.' "'Is this a practical joke?' he said at last, in a way that set about sixteen drafts cutting through the room at once. I thought it was up to me to rally round old Corky. "'You want to stand a bit farther away from it,' I said. "'You're perfectly right,' he snorted. "'I do. I want to stand so far away from it I can't see the thing with a telescope.' He turned on Corky like an untamed tiger of the jungle who has just located a chunk of meat. And this, this 
is what you have been wasting your time and my money for all these years? A painter? I wouldn't let you paint a house of mine. I gave you this commission, thinking that you were a competent worker, and this, this, this extract from a comic-colored supplement is the result. He swung towards the door, lashing his tail and growling to himself. This ends it. If you wish to continue this foolery of pretending to be an artist because you want an excuse for idleness, please yourself. But let me tell you this. Unless you report at my office on Monday morning, prepared to abandon all this idiocy and start at the bottom of the business to work your way up, as you should have a half dozen years ago, not another cent. Not another cent. Not another. Then the door closed, and he was no longer with us, and I crawled out of the bomb-proof shelter. "'Corky, old top,' I whispered faintly. Corky was standing staring at the picture. His face was set. There was a hunted look in his eye. "'Well, that finishes it,' he muttered brokenly. "'What are you going to do?' "'Do? What can I do?' I can't stick on here if he cuts off supplies. You heard what he said. I shall have to go to the office on Monday. I couldn't think of a thing to say. I knew exactly how he felt about the office. I don't know when I've been so infernally uncomfortable. It was just like hanging round trying to make conversation to a pal who's just been sentenced to twenty years in quad. And then a soothing voice broke the silence. "'If I might make a suggestion, sir.' It was Jeeves. He had slid from the shadows and was gazing gravely at the picture. "'Upon my word, I can't give you a better idea of the shattering effect of Corky's Uncle Alexander when in action than by saying that he had absolutely made me forget for the moment that Jeeves was there. "'I wonder if I have ever happened to mention to you, sir, a Mr. Digby Thistleton, with whom I was once in service. Perhaps you have met him. He was a financier. He is now Lord Bridgenorth. It was a favorite saying of his that there is always a way. The first time I heard him use the expression was after the failure of a patent depilatory which he promoted. Jeeves, I said, what on earth are you talking about? I mentioned Mr. Thistleton, sir, because his was in some respects a parallel case to the present one. His depilatory failed, but he did not despair. He put it on the market again under the name of Harrow, guaranteed to produce a full crop of hair in a few months. It was advertised, if you remember, sir, by a humorous picture of a billiard ball, before and after taking and made such a substantial fortune that Mr. Thistleton was soon afterwards elevated to the peerage for services to his party. It seems to me that, if Mr. Corcoran looks into the matter, he will find that, like Mr. Thistleton, there is always a way. Mr. Warple himself suggested the solution of the difficulty. In the heat of the moment, he compared the portrait to an extract from a colored comic supplement. I consider the suggestion a very valuable one, sir. Mr. Corcoran's portrait may not have pleased Mr. Warple as a likeness of his only child, but I have no doubt that editors would gladly consider it as a foundation for a series of humorous drawings. If Mr. Corcoran will allow me to make the suggestion, his talent has always been for the humorous. There is something about this picture— something bold and vigorous, which arrests the attention. I feel sure it would be highly popular. Corky was glaring at the picture, and making a sort of dry, sucking noise with his mouth. He seemed completely overwrought. And then, suddenly, he began to laugh in a wild way. "'Corky, old man,' I said, massaging him tenderly. I feared the poor blighter was hysterical. He began to stagger about all over the floor. "'He's right! The man's absolutely right! Jeeves, you're a lifesaver! 
you've hit on the greatest idea of the age. Report at the office on Monday, start at the bottom of the business, I'll buy the business if I feel like it. I know the man who runs the comic section of the Sunday Star. He'll eat this thing. He was telling me only the other day how hard it was to get a good new series. He'll give me anything I ask for a real winner like this. I've got a gold mine. Where's my hat? I've got an income for life. Where's that confounded hat? Uh, lend me a fiver, Bertie. I want to take a taxi down to Park Row. Jeeves smiled paternally. Or rather, he had a kind of paternal muscular spasm about the mouth, which is the nearest he ever gets to smiling. If I might make the suggestion, Mr. Corcoran, for a title of the series which you have in mind. The Adventures of Baby Blobs. Corky and I looked at the picture, then at each other in an awed way. Jeeves was right. There could be no other title. Jeeves, I said. It was a few weeks later, and I had just finished looking at the comic section of the Sunday Star. I'm an optimist. I always have been. The older I get, the more I agree with Shakespeare and those poet johnnies about it always being darkest before the dawn, and, and there's a silver lining, and what you lose on the swings you make up on the roundabouts. Look at Mr. Corcoran, for instance. There was a fellow, one would have said, clear up to the eyebrows in the soup. To all appearances, he had got it right in the neck. Yet, look at him now. Have you seen these pictures? I took the liberty of glancing at them before bringing them to you, sir. Extremely diverting. They have made a big hit, you know. I anticipated it, sir. I leaned back against the pillows. You know, Jeeves, you're a genius. You ought to be drawing a commission on these things. I have nothing to complain of in that respect, sir. Mr. Corcoran has been most generous. I am putting out the brown suit, sir. No, I think I'll wear the blue with the faint red stripe. Not the blue with the faint red stripe, sir. But I rather fancy myself in it. Not the blue with the faint red stripe, sir. Oh, all right. Have it your own way. Very good, sir. Thank you, sir. Of course, I know it's as bad as being henpecked, but then Jeeves is always right. You have to consider that, you know, what? End of Leave It to Jeeves My Man Jeeves by P. G. Wodehouse Two Jeeves and the Unbidden Guest I'm not absolutely certain of my facts, but I rather fancy it's Shakespeare, or if not, it's some equally brainy lad, who says that it's always just when a chappie is feeling particularly top-hole, and more than usually braced with things in general, that fate sneaks up behind him with a bit of lead piping. There's no doubt the man's right. It's absolutely that way with me. Take, for instance, the fairly rummy matter of Lady Malvern and her son Wilmot. A moment before they turned up, I was just thinking how thoroughly all right everything was. It was one of those topping mornings, and I had just climbed out from under the cold shower, feeling like a two-year-old. As a matter of fact, I was especially bucked just then, because the day before I had asserted myself with Jeeves. Absolutely asserted myself, don't you know? You see, the way things have been going on, I was rapidly becoming a dashed serf. The man had jolly well oppressed me. I didn't so much mind when he made me give up one of my new suits, because Jeeves' judgment about suits is sound, but I as near as a toucher rebelled when he wouldn't let me wear a pair of cloth-topped boots, which I loved like a couple of brothers. And when he tried to tread on me like a worm in the matter of a hat, I jolly well put my foot down and showed him who was who. It's a long story, and I haven't time to tell you now, but the point is that he wanted me to wear the long acre, as worn by John Drew, when I had set my heart on the country gentleman, as worn by another famous actor chappie. And the end of the matter was that, after a rather painful scene, 
I bought the country gentleman. So that's how things stood on this particular morning, and I was feeling kind of manly and independent. Well, I was in the bathroom, wondering what there was going to be for breakfast while I massaged the good old spine with a rough towel and sang slightly, when there was a tap at the door. I stopped singing and opened the door an inch. "'What ho without there?' "'Lady Malvern wishes to see you, sir,' said Jeeves. "'Eh?' "'Lady Malvern, sir. She is waiting in the sitting-room.' "'Pull yourself together, Jeeves, my man,' I said, rather severely, for I bar practical jokes before breakfast. "'You know perfectly well there is no one waiting for me in the sitting-room. How could there be when it's barely ten o'clock yet?' "'I gather from her ladyship, sir, that she had landed from an ocean liner at an early hour this morning.' This made the thing a bit more plausible. I remembered that, when I had arrived in America about a year before, the proceedings had begun at some ghastly hour like six, and that I had been shot out on to a foreign shore considerably before eight. Who the deuce is Lady Melvern, Jeeves? Her ladyship did not confide in me, sir. Is she alone? Her ladyship is accompanied by a Lord Pershore, sir. I fancy that his lordship would be her ladyship's son. Oh, well, put out rich raiment of sorts, and I'll be dressing. Our heather mixture lounge is in readiness, sir. Then lead me to it. While I was dressing, I kept trying to think who on earth Lady Malvern could be. It wasn't until I had climbed through the top of my shirt and was reaching out for the studs that I remembered. I placed her, Jeeves. She's a pal of my Aunt Agatha. Indeed, sir. Yes, I met her at lunch one Sunday before I left London. A very vicious specimen. Writes books. She wrote a book on social conditions in India when she came back from the Durbar. Yes, sir. Uh, pardon me, sir, but not that tie. Eh? Not that tie with the heather mixture lounge, sir. It was a shock to me. I thought I had quelled the fellow. It was rather a solemn moment. What I mean is, if I weaken now, all my good work the night before would be thrown away. I braced myself. What's wrong with this tie? I've seen you give it a nasty look before. Speak out like a man. What's the matter with it? Too ornate, sir. Nonsense. A cheerful pink. Nothing more. Unsuitable, sir. Jeeves, this is the tie I wear. Very good, sir. Dash it, unpleasant. I could see that the man was wounded, but I was firm. I tied the tie, got into the coat and waistcoat, and went into the sitting-room. "'Hello, hello, hello,' I said. "'What?' "'Ah, how do you do, Mr. Wooster? You have never met my son, Wilmot, I think. Motty, darling, this is Mr. Wooster.' Lady Malvern was a hearty, happy, healthy, overpowering sort of dashed female, not so very tall, but making up for it by measuring about six feet from the O.P. to the prompt side. She fitted into my biggest armchair, as if it had been built round her by someone who knew they were wearing armchairs tight about the hips that season. She had bright, bulging eyes, and a lot of yellow hair, and when she spoke she showed about fifty-seven front teeth. She was one of those women who kind of numb a fellow's faculties. She made me feel as if I were ten years old and had been brought into the drawing-room in my Sunday clothes to say how do you do. Altogether, by no means the sort of a thing a chappie would wish to find in his sitting-room before breakfast. Motty, the son, was about twenty-three, tall and thin and meek-looking. He had the same yellow hair as his mother, but he wore it plastered down and parted in the middle. His eyes bulged, too, but they weren't bright. They were a dull gray with pink rims. His chin gave up the struggle about halfway down, and he didn't appear to have any eyelashes. A mild, furtive, sheepish sort of blighter, in short. "'Awfully glad to see you,' I said. "'So, you've popped over, eh? Making a long stay in America?' "'About a month. Your aunt gave me your address and told me to be sure and call on you.' I was glad to hear this, 
as it showed that Aunt Agatha was beginning to come round a bit. There had been some unpleasantness a year before when she had sent me over to New York to disentangle my cousin Gussie from the clutches of a girl on the music-hall stage. When I tell you that by the time I had finished my operations, Gussie had not only married the girl, but had gone on the stage himself and was doing well, you'll understand that Aunt Agatha was upset to no small extent. I simply hadn't dared to go back and face her, and it was a relief to find that time had healed the wound and all that sort of thing enough to make her tell her pals to look me up. What I mean is, much as I'd liked America, I didn't want to have England barred to me for the rest of my natural, and believe me, England is a jolly sight too small for anyone to live in with Aunt Agatha if she's really on the warpath. So I braced on hearing these kind words and smiled genially on the assemblage. Your aunt said that you would do anything that was in your power to be of assistance to us. Rather? Oh, rather, absolutely. Thank you so much. I want you to put dear Mahdi up for a little while. I didn't get this for a moment. Put him up? For my clubs? No, no. Darling Mahdi is essentially a home bird. Aren't you, Mahdi, darling? Mahdi, who was sucking the knob of his stick, uncorked himself. Y yes, mother, he said and corked himself up again. I should not like him to belong to clubs. I mean put him up here. Have him to live with you while I am away. These frightful words trickled out of her like honey. The woman simply didn't seem to understand the ghastly nature of her proposal. I gave Mahdi the swift east to west. He was sitting with his mouth nuzzling the stick, blinking at the wall. The thought of having this planted on me for an indefinite period appalled me. Absolutely appalled me, don't you know? I was just starting to say that the shot wasn't on the board at any price, and that the first sign Mottie gave of trying to nestle into my little home I would yell for the police, when she went on, rolling placidly over me, as it were. There was something about this woman that sapped a chappie's willpower. I am leaving New York by the midday train, as I have to pay a visit to Sing Sing Prison. I am extremely interested in prison conditions in America. After that I work my way gradually across to the coast, visiting the points of interest on the journey. You see, Mr. Wooster, I am in America principally on business. No doubt you read my book, India and the Indians? My publishers are anxious for me to write a companion volume on the United States. I shall not be able to spend more than a month in the country, as I have to get back for the season, but a month should be ample. I was less than a month in India, and my dear friend Sir Roger Cremorne wrote his America from Within after a stay of only two weeks. I should love to take dear Mahdi with me, but the poor boy gets so sick when he travels by train. I shall have to pick him up on my return. From where I sat I could see Jeeves in the dining-room, laying the breakfast-table. I wished I could have had a minute with him alone. I felt certain that he would have been able to think of some way of putting a stop to this woman. "'It will be such a relief to know that Mahdi is safe with you, Mr. Wooster. I know what the temptations of a great city are. Hitherto dear Mahdi has been sheltered from them. He has lived quietly with me in the country. I know that you will look after him carefully, Mr. Wooster. He will give very little trouble.' She talked about the poor blighter as if he wasn't there. Not that Mahdi seemed to mind. He had stopped chewing his walking-stick and was sitting there with his mouth open. He is a vegetarian and a teetotaler, and is devoted to reading. Give him a nice book and he will be quite contented. She got up. Thank you so much, Mr. Wooster. I don't know what I should have done without your help. Come, Mahdi. We have just time to see a few of the sights before my train goes. But I shall have to rely on you for most of my information about New York, darling. Be sure to keep your eyes open and take notes of your impressions. It will be such a help. Good-bye, Mr. Wooster. I will send Muddy back early in the afternoon. They went out, and I howled for Jeeves. Jeeves! What about it? Sir? What's to be done? You heard it all, didn't you? You were in the dining-room most of the time. That pill is coming to stay here. Pill, sir? The excrescence. 
I beg your pardon, sir? I looked at Jeeves sharply. This sort of thing wasn't like him. It was as if he was deliberately trying to give me the pip. Then I understood. The man was really upset about that tie. He was trying to get his own back. "'Lord Pershor will be staying from here tonight, Jeeves,' I said coldly. "'Very good, sir. Breakfast is ready, sir.' I could have sobbed into the bacon and eggs. That there wasn't any sympathy to be got out of Jeeves was what put the lid on it. For a moment I almost weakened and told him to destroy the hat and tie if he didn't like them, but I pulled myself together again. I was dashed if I was going to let Jeeves treat me like a bally one-man chain gang. But, what with brooding on Jeeves and brooding on Maudie, I was in a pretty reduced sort of state. The more I examined the situation, the more blighted it became. There was nothing I could do. If I slung Maudie out, he would report to his mother, and she would pass it on to Aunt Agatha, and I didn't like to think what would happen then. Sooner or later, I should be wanting to go back to England, and I didn't want to get there and find Aunt Agatha waiting on the quay for me with a stuffed eel skin. There was absolutely nothing for it but to put the fellow up and make the best of it. About midday, Monty's luggage arrived, and soon afterwards a large parcel of what I took to be nice books. I brightened up a little when I saw it. It was one of those massive parcels, and looked as if it had enough in it to keep the chappie busy for a year. I felt a trifle more cheerful, and I got my country gentleman hat and stuck it on my head, and gave the pink tie a twist, and reeled out to take a bite of lunch with one or two of the lads at a neighboring hostelry and what with excellent browsing and sluicing and cheery conversation and what not, the afternoon passed quite happily. By dinner-time I had almost forgotten blighted Maudie's existence. I dined at the club and looked in at a show afterwards, and it wasn't till fairly late that I got back to the flat. There were no signs of Maudie, and I took it that he had gone to bed. It seemed rummy to me, though, that the parcel of nice books was still there with the string and paper on it. It looked as if Maudie, after seeing Mother off at the station, had decided to call it a day. Jeeves came in with the nightly whiskey and soda. I could tell by the chappie's manner that he was still upset. "'Lord Pershore gone to bed, Jeeves?' I asked, with reserved hauteur and what not. "'No, sir. His lordship has not yet returned.' not returned. What do you mean? His lordship came in shortly after six-thirty, and, having dressed, went out again. At this moment there was a noise outside the front door, a sort of scrabbling noise, as if somebody were trying to paw his way through the woodwork, then a sort of thud. Better go and see what that is, Jeeves. Very good, sir. He went out and came back in again. If you would not mind stepping this way, sir, I think we might be able to carry him in. Carry him in? His lordship is lying on the mat, sir. I went to the front door. The man was right. There was Maudie, huddled up outside on the floor. He was moaning a bit. He's had some sort of dashed fit, I said. I took another look. Jeeves, someone's been feeding him meat. Sir? He's a vegetarian, you know. He must have been digging into a steak or something. Call up a doctor. I hardly think it will be necessary, sir, if you will take his lordship's legs while I— Great Scott, Jeeves, you don't think he can't be— I am inclined to think so, sir. And by Jove, he was right. Once on the right track, you couldn't mistake it. Motty was under the surface. It was the deuce of a shock. You never can tell, Jeeves. Very seldom, sir. Remove the eye of authority, and where are you? Precisely, sir. Where is my wandering boy tonight, and all that sort of thing? What? It would seem so, sir. Well, we had better bring him in, eh? Yes, sir. So we lugged him in, and Jeeves put him to bed, and I lit a cigarette and sat down to think the thing over. I had a kind of foreboding. It seemed to me that I had let myself in for something pretty rocky. 
Next morning, after I had sucked down a thoughtful cup of tea, I went into Mottie's room to investigate. I expected to find the fellow a wreck, but there he was, sitting up in bed, quite chirpy, reading gingery stories. "'What ho?' I said. "'What ho?' said Mottie. "'What ho, what ho? What ho, what ho, what ho?' After that it seemed rather difficult to go on with the conversation. "'How are you feeling this morning?' I asked. "'Topping,' replied Mottie, blithely and with abandon. "'I say, you know that fellow of yours, Jeeves, you know, is a corker. I had a most frightful headache when I woke up, and he brought me a sort of rummy dark drink, and it put me right again at once. Said it was his own invention. I must see more of that lad. He seems to me distinctly one of the ones.' I couldn't believe that this was the same blighter who had sat and sucked his stick the day before. "'You ate something that disagreed with you last night, didn't you?' I said, by way of giving him a chance to slide out of it if he wanted to. But he wouldn't have it at any price. "'No,' he replied firmly. "'I didn't do anything of the kind. I drank too much. Much too much. Lots and lots too much. And what's more, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it every night.' If ever you see me sober, old top, he said, and with a kind of holy exaltation, tap me on the shoulder and say, tut tut, and I'll apologize and remedy the defect. But I say, you know, what about me? What about you? Well, I'm, so to speak, as it were, kind of responsible for you. What I mean to say is, if you go doing this sort of thing, I'm apt to get in the soup somewhat. I can't help your trouble, said Mottie firmly. Listen to me, old thing. This is the first time in my life that I've had a real chance to yield to the temptations of a great city. What's the use of a great city having temptations if fellows don't yield to them? Makes it so bally discouraging for a great city. Besides, Mother told me to keep my eyes open and collect impressions. I sat on the edge of the bed. I felt dizzy. I know just how you feel, old dear, said Mottie consolingly, and if my principles would permit it, I would simmer down for your sake. But duty first. This is the first time I've been let out alone, and I mean to make the most of it. We're only young once. Why interfere with life's morning? Young man, rejoice in thy youth. Tra-la, wat-ho. Put like that, it did seem reasonable. All my bally life, dear boy, Mottie went on, I've been cooped up in the ancestral home in Much Middlefold in Shropshire. Until you've been cooped up in Much Middlefold, you don't know what cooping is. The only time we get any excitement is when one of the choir boys is caught sucking chocolate during the sermon. When that happens, we talk about it for days. I've got about a month of New York, and I mean to store up a few happy memories for the long winter evenings. This is my only chance to collect a past, and I'm going to do it. Now tell me, old sport, as man to man, how does one get in touch with that very decent chappy Jeeves? Does one ring the bell or shout a bit? I should like to discuss the subject of a good stiff B&S with him. I had had a sort of vague idea, don't you know, that if I stuck close to Mottie and went about the place with him, I might act as a bit of a damper on the gaiety. What I mean is, I thought that if when he was being the life and soul of the party, he were to catch my reproving eye, he might ease up a trifle on the revelry. So the next night I took him along to supper with me. It was the last time. I'm a quiet, peaceful sort of chappie who has lived all his life in London, and I can't stand the pace these swift sportsmen from the rural districts set. What I mean to say is this. I'm all for rational enjoyment and so forth, but I think a chappie makes himself conspicuous when he throws soft-boiled eggs at the electric fan. And decent mirth and all that sort of thing are all right, but I do bar dancing on tables and having to dash all over the place dodging waiters, managers, and chuckers out just when you want to sit still and digest. Directly I managed to tear myself away that night and get home. I made up my mind that this was jolly well the last time I went about with Mottie. The only time I met him late at night after that was once when I passed the door of a fairly low-down sort of restaurant and had to step aside to dodge him as he sailed through the air en route for the opposite pavement, with a muscular sort of looking chappie peering out after him with a kind of gloomy satisfaction. In a way, 
I couldn't help sympathizing with the fellow. He had about four weeks to have the good time that ought to have been spread over about ten years, and I didn't wonder at his wanting to be pretty busy. I should have been just the same in his place. Still, there was no denying that it was a bit thick. If it hadn't been for the thought of Lady Malvern and Aunt Agatha in the background, I should have regarded Maudie's rapid work with an indulgent smile. But I couldn't get rid of the feeling that sooner or later I was the lad who was scheduled to get it behind the ear. And what with brooding on this prospect, and sitting up in the old flat waiting for the familiar footstep, and putting it to bed when it got there, and stealing to the sick chamber the next morning to contemplate the wreckage, I was beginning to lose weight. Absolutely becoming the good old shadow, I give you my honest word, starting at sudden noises and what not. And no sympathy from Jeeves. That was what cut me to the quick. The man was still thoroughly pipped about the hat and tie, and simply wouldn't rally round. One morning I wanted comforting so much that I sank the pride of the Woosters and appealed to the fellow direct. Jeeves, I said, this is getting a bit thick. Sir, business and cold respectfulness. You know what I mean. This lad seems to have chucked all the principles of a well-spent boyhood. He's got it up his nose. Yes, sir. Well, I shall get blamed, don't you know? You know what my Aunt Agatha is. Yes, sir. Very well, then. They waited a moment, but he wouldn't unbend. Jeeves, I said, haven't you any scheme up your sleeve for coping with this blighter? No, sir. And he shimmered off to his lair. Obstinate devil! So dashed absurd, don't you know? It wasn't as if there was anything wrong with that country gentleman hat. It was a remarkably priceless effort, and much admired by the lads. But just because he preferred the long acre, he left me flat. It was shortly after this that young Muddy got the idea of bringing pals back in the small hours to continue the gay revels in the home. This was where I began to crack under the strain. You see, the part of town where I was living wasn't the right place for that sort of thing. I knew lots of chappies down Washington Square way who started the evening at about 2 a.m., artists and writers and what not, who frolicked considerably till checked by the arrival of the morning milk. That was all right. They like that sort of thing down there. The neighbors can't get to sleep unless there's someone dancing Hawaiian dances over their heads. But on 57th Street the atmosphere wasn't right. And when Maudie turned up at three in the morning with a collection of hardy lads, who only stopped singing their college song when they started singing The Old Oaken Bucket, there was a marked peevishness among the old settlers in the flats. The management was extremely terse over the telephone at breakfast time and took a lot of soothing. The next night I came home early, after a lonely dinner at a place which I had chosen because there didn't seem any chance of meeting Maudie there. The sitting room was quite dark, and I was just moving to switch on the light when there was a sort of explosion and something collared hold of my trouser leg. Living with Maudie had reduced me to such an extent that I was simply unable to cope with this thing. I jumped backward with a loud yell of anguish and tumbled out into the hall just as Jeeves came out of his den to see what the matter was. Did you call, sir? Jeeves, there's something in there that grabs you by the leg. That would be Rollo, sir. Eh? I would have warned you of his presence, but I did not hear you come in. His temper is a little uncertain at present, as he has not yet settled down. Who the deuce is Rollo? His lordship's bull terrier, sir. His lordship won him in a raffle and tied him to the leg of the table. If you will allow me, sir, I will go in and switch on the light. There really is nobody like Jeeves. He walked straight into the sitting-room, the biggest feat since Daniel in the lion's den, without a quiver. What's more, his magnetism, or whatever they call it, was such that the dashed animal, instead of pinning him by the leg, calmed down as if it had had a bromide, and rolled over on his back with all of his paws in the air. If Jeeves had been his rich uncle he couldn't have been more chummy. Yet directly he caught sight of me again he got all worked up and seemed to have only one idea in life, to start chewing me where he had left off. 
Rollo is not used to you yet, sir, said Jeeves, regarding the bally quadruped in an admiring sort of way. He is an excellent watchdog. I don't want a watchdog to keep me out of my rooms. No, sir. Well, what am I to do? No doubt in time the animal will learn to discriminate, sir. He will learn to distinguish your peculiar scent. What do you mean, my peculiar scent? Correct the impression that I intend to hang about in the hall while life slips by in the hope that one of these days that dashed animal will decide that I smell all right. I thought for a bit. Jeeves, sir, I'm going away. Tomorrow morning by the first train. I shall go and stop with Mr. Todd in the country. Do you wish me to accompany you, sir? No. Very good, sir. I don't know when I shall be back. Forward my letters. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, I was back within the week. Rocky Todd, the pal I went to stay with, is a rummy sort of a chap who lives all alone in the wilds of Long Island, and likes it but a little of that sort of thing goes a long way with me. Dear old Rocky is one of the best, but after a few days in his cottage in the woods miles away from anywhere, New York, even with Maudie on the premises, began to look pretty good to me. The days down on Long Island have forty-eight hours in them. You can't get to sleep at night because of the bellowing of the crickets, and you have to walk two miles for a drink and six for an evening paper. I thanked Rocky for his kind hospitality and caught the only train they have down in those parts. It landed me in New York about dinner time. I went straight to the old flat. Jeeves came out of his lair. I looked round cautiously for Rollo. Where's that dog, Jeeves? Have you got him tied up? The animal is no longer here, sir. His lordship gave him to the porter who sold him. His lordship took a prejudice against the animal on account of being bitten by him in the calf of the leg. I don't think I've ever been so bucked by a bit of news. I felt I had misjudged Rollo. Evidently, when you got to know him better, he had a lot of intelligence in him. Ripping, I said. Is Lord Pershor in, Jeeves? No, sir. Do you expect him back to dinner? No, sir. Where is he? In prison, sir. Have you ever trodden on a rake and had the handle jump up and hit you? That's how I felt then. In prison? Yes, sir. You don't mean in prison? Yes, sir. I lowered myself into a chair. Why? I said. He assaulted a constable, sir. Lord Pershore assaulted a constable? Yes, sir. I digested this. But, Jeeves, I say, this is frightful. Sir? What will Lady Malvern say when she finds out? I do not fancy that her ladyship will find out, sir. But she'll come back and want to know where he is. I rather fancy, sir, that his lordship's bit of time will have run out by then. But supposing it hasn't? In that event, sir, it may be judicious to prevaricate a little. How? If I might make the suggestion, sir, I should inform her ladyship that his lordship has left for a short visit to Boston. Why Boston? Very interesting and respectable centre, sir. Jeeves, I believe you've hit it. I fancy so, sir. Why, this is really the best thing that could have happened. If this hadn't turned up to prevent him, young Mottie would have been in a sanatorium by the time Lady Malvern got back. Exactly, sir. The more I looked at it that way, the sounder this prison wee seemed to me. There was no doubt in the world that prison was just what the doctor ordered for Mottie. It was the only thing that could have pulled him up. I was sorry for the poor blighter, but after all I reflected, a chappie who had lived all his life with Lady Malvern, in a small village in the interior of Shropshire, wouldn't have much to kick at in a prison. Altogether, I began to feel absolutely braced again. Life became like what that poet Johnny says, one grand sweet song. Things went on so comfortably and peaceably for a couple of weeks 
that I give you my word that I had almost forgotten such a person as Maudie existed. The only flaw in the scheme of things was that Jeeves was still pained and distant. It wasn't anything he said or did, mind you, but there was a rummy something about him all the time. Once, when I was tying the pink tie, I caught sight of him in the looking-glass. There was a kind of grieved look in his eye. And then Lady Malvern came back, a good bit ahead of schedule. I hadn't been expecting her for days. I'd forgotten how time had been slipping along. She turned up one morning while I was still in bed sipping tea and thinking of this and that. Jeeves flowed in with the announcement that he had just loosed her into the sitting-room. I draped a few garments round me and went in. There she was, sitting in the same armchair, looking as massive as ever. The only difference was that she didn't uncover the teeth, as she had done the first time. "'Good morning,' I said. "'So you've got back, what?' "'I have got back.' There was something sort of bleak about her tone, rather as if she had swallowed an east wind. This I took to be due to the fact that she probably hadn't breakfasted. It's only after a bit of breakfast that I'm able to regard the world with that sunny cheeriness which makes a fellow the universal favorite. I'm never much of a lad till I've engulfed an egg or two and a beaker of coffee. I suppose you haven't breakfasted? I have not yet breakfasted. Won't you have an egg or something, or a sausage or something, or something? No, thank you. She spoke as if she belonged to an anti-sausage society, or a league for the suppression of eggs. There was a bit of silence. I called on you last night, she said, but you were out. Awfully sorry. Had a pleasant trip. Extremely, thank you. See everything? Niagara Falls, Yellowstone Park, and the jolly old Grand Canyon, and what not? I saw a great deal. There was another slightly frappé silence. Jeeves floated silently into the dining-room and began to lay the breakfast-table. I hope Wilmot was not in your way, Mr. Wooster. I had been wondering when she was going to mention Mutty. Rather not. Great pals. Hit it off splendidly. You were his constant companion, then? Absolutely. We were always together. Saw all the sights, don't you know? We take in the Museum of Art in the morning, and have a bit of lunch at some good vegetarian place, and then toddle along to a sacred concert in the afternoon, and home to an early dinner. We usually play dominoes after dinner, and then the early bed and the refreshing sleep. We had a great time. I was awfully sorry when he went away to Boston. Oh, Wilmot is in Boston? Yes, I ought to have let you know, but of course we didn't know where you were. You were dodging all over the place like a snipe. I mean, don't you know, dodging all over the place, and we couldn't get at you. Yes, Mahdi went off to Boston. You're sure he went to Boston? Oh, absolutely. I called out to Jeeves, who was now messing about in the next room with forks and so forth. Jeeves, Lord Pershore didn't change his mind about going to Boston, did he? No, sir. I thought I was right. Yes, Mahdi went to Boston. Then how do you account, Mr. Wooster, for the fact that when I went yesterday afternoon to Blackwell's Island Prison to secure material for my book, I saw poor, dear Wilmot there, dressed in a striped suit, seated beside a pile of stones with a hammer in his hands? I tried to think of something to say, but nothing came. A chappie has to be a lot broader about the forehead than I am to handle a jolt like this, I strained the old bean till it creaked, but between the collar and the hair parting nothing stirred. I was dumb, which was lucky because I wouldn't have had a chance to get any persiflage out of my system. Lady Malvern collared the conversation. She had been bottling it up, and now it came out with a rush. So this is how you have looked after my poor dear boy, Mr. Wooster. So this is how you have abused my trust. I left him in your charge thinking that I could rely on you to shield him from evil. He came to you innocent, unversed in the ways of the world, confiding, unused to the temptations of a large city, and you led him astray. 
I hadn't any remarks to make. All I could think of was the picture of Aunt Agatha drinking all this in and reaching out to sharpen the hatchet against my return. You deliberately! Far away, in the misty distance, a soft voice spoke. If I might explain, your ladyship. Jeeves had projected himself in from the dining-room and materialized on the rug. Lady Malvern tried to freeze him with a look, but you can't do that sort of thing to Jeeves. He is look-proof. I fancy, your ladyship, that you have misunderstood Mr. Wooster, and that he may have given you the impression that he was in New York when his lordship was removed. When Mr. Wooster informed your ladyship that his lordship had gone to Boston, he was relying on the version I had given him of his lordship's movements. Mr. Wooster was away, visiting a friend in the country at the time, and knew nothing of the matter till your ladyship informed him. Lady Malvern gave a kind of grunt. It didn't rattle Jeeves. I feared Mr. Wooster might be disturbed if he knew the truth, as he is so attached to his lordship, and has taken such pains to look after him so I took the liberty of telling him that his lordship had gone away for a visit. It might have been hard for Mr. Wooster to believe that his lordship had gone to prison voluntarily, and from the best motives, but your ladyship, knowing him better, will readily understand. What? Lady Malvern goggled at him. Did you say that Lord Pershaw went to prison voluntarily? If I might explain, your ladyship, I think that your ladyship's parting words made a deep impression on his lordship. I have frequently heard him speak to Mr. Wooster of his desire to do something to follow your ladyship's instructions and collect material for your ladyship's book on America. Mr. Wooster will bear me out when I say that his lordship was frequently extremely depressed at the thought that he was doing so little to help. Absolutely, by Jove, quite pipped about it, I said. The idea of making a personal examination into the prison system of the country, from within, occurred to his lordship very suddenly one night. He embraced it eagerly. There was no restraining him. Lady Malvern looked at Jeeves, then at me, then at Jeeves again. I could see her struggling with the thing. "'Surely, your ladyship,' said Jeeves, it is more reasonable to suppose that a gentleman of his lordship's character went to prison of his own volition than that he committed some breach of the law which necessitated his arrest. Lady Malvern blinked. Then she got up. Mr. Wooster, she said, I apologize. I have done you an injustice. I should have known Wilmot better. I should have had more faith in his pure, fine spirit. "'Absolutely,' I said. "'Your breakfast is ready, sir,' said Jeeves. I sat down and dallied in a dazed sort of way with a poached egg. "'Jeeves,' I said, "'you are certainly a lifesaver.' "'Thank you, sir.' Nothing would have convinced my Aunt Agatha that I had lured that blighter into riotous living. "'I fancy you are right, sir.' I champed on my egg for a bit. I was most awfully moved, don't you know, by the way Jeeves had rallied round. Something seemed to tell me that this was an occasion that called for rich rewards. For a moment I hesitated. Then I made up my mind. Jeeves? Sir? That pink tie? Yes, sir. Burn it. Thank you, sir. And Jeeves? Yes, sir. Take a taxi and... Get me that long-acre hat, as worn by John Drew. Thank you very much, sir. I felt most awfully braced. I felt as if the clouds had rolled away and all was as it used to be. I felt like one of those chappies in the novels who calls off the fight with his wife in the last chapter and decides to forget and forgive. I felt I wanted to do all sorts of other things to show Jeeves that I appreciated him. "'Jeeves,' I said, "'it isn't enough. Is there anything else you would like?' "'Yes, sir. If I may make the suggestion, fifty dollars.' Fifty dollars? It will help me enable to pay a debt of honour, sir. I owe it to his lordship.' 
You owe Lord Pershore fifty dollars? Yes, sir. I happened to meet him in the street that night his lordship was arrested. I had been thinking a good deal about the most suitable method of inducing him to abandon his mode of living, sir. His lordship was a little overexcited at the time, and I fancy that he mistook me for a friend of his. At any rate, when I took the liberty of wagering him fifty dollars that he would not punch a passing policeman in the eye, he accepted the bet very cordially and won it. I produced my pocket-book and counted out a hundred. "'Take this, Jeeves,' I said. Fifty isn't enough. "'Do you know, Jeeves, you're—' "'Well, you absolutely stand alone.' "'I endeavour to give satisfaction, sir,' said Jeeves. End of Jeeves and the Unbidden Guest My Man Jeeves by P. G. Wodehouse 3. Jeeves and the Hard-Boiled Egg Sometimes of a morning, as I've sat in bed sucking down the early cup of tea and watched my man Jeeves flitting about the room and putting out the raiment for the day, I've wondered what the deuce I should do if the fellow ever took it into his head to leave me. It's not so bad now I'm in New York, but in London the anxiety was frightful. There used to be all sorts of attempts on the part of low blighters to sneak him away from me. Young Reggie Foljam, to my certain knowledge, offered him double what I was giving him, and Alastair Bingham Reeves, who's got a valet who had been known to press his trousers sideways, used to look at him, when he came to see me, with a kind of glittery hungry eye that disturbed me deucedly. Bally pirates! The thing, you see, is that Jeeves is so dashed competent. You can spot it even in the way he shoves studs into a shirt. I rely on him absolutely in every crisis, and he never lets me down. And what's more, he can always be counted on to extend himself on behalf of any pal of mine who happens to be, to all appearances, knee-deep in the bullion. Take the rather rummy case, for instance, of dear old Bicky and his uncle, the hard-boiled egg. It happened after I had been in America for a few months. I got back to the flat latish one night, and when Jeeves brought me the final drink, he said, "'Mr. Bickersteth called to see you this evening, sir, while you were out.' "'Oh,' I said, "'twice, sir. He appeared a trifle agitated.' "'What? Pipped? He gave that impression, sir.' I sipped the whiskey. I was sorry if Bicky was in trouble, but, as a matter of fact, I was rather glad to have something I could discuss freely with Jeeves just then, because things had been a bit strained between us for some time, and it had been rather difficult to hit on something to talk about that wasn't apt to take a personal turn. You see, I had decided, rightly or wrongly, to grow a mustache, and this had cut Jeeves to the quick. He couldn't stick the thing at any price and I had been living ever since in an atmosphere of bally disapproval, till I was getting jolly well fed up with it. What I mean is, while there is no doubt that in certain matters of dress, Jeeves's judgment is absolutely sound and should be followed, it seemed to me that it was getting a bit too thick if he was going to edit my face as well as my costume. No one can call me an unreasonable chappy, and many's the time I've given in like a lamb when Jeeves has voted against one of my pet suits or ties. But when it comes to a valet staking out a claim on your upper lip, you've simply got to have a bit of a good old bulldog pluck and defy the blighter. He said that he would call again later, sir. Something must be up, Jeeves. Yes, sir. I gave the mustache a thoughtful twirl. It seemed to hurt Jeeves a good deal so I chucked it. I see by the paper, sir, that Mr. Bickersteth's uncle is arriving on the Carmantic. Yes? His Grace the Duke of Chiswick, sir. This was news to me that Bicky's uncle was a duke. Rum, how little one knows about one's pals. I had met Bicky for the first time at a species of beano or jamboree down in Washington Square, not long after my arrival in New York. I suppose I was a bit homesick at the time, and I rather took to Bicky when I found out he was an Englishman, and had, in fact, been up at Oxford with me. 
Besides, he was a frightful chump, so we naturally drifted together, and while we were taking a quiet snort in a corner that wasn't all cluttered up with artists and sculptors and what not, he furthermore endeared himself to me by a most extraordinarily gifted imitation of a bull terrier chasing a cat up a tree. But, though we had subsequently become extremely pally, all I really knew about him was that he was generally hard up, and had an uncle who relieved the strain a bit from time to time by sending him monthly remittances. "'If the Duke of Chiswick is his uncle,' I said, "'why hasn't he a title? Why isn't he Lord what not? "'Mr. Bickersteth is the son of his grace's late sister, sir, "'who married Captain Rollo Bickersteth of the Coldstream Guards.' "'Jeeves knows everything.' "'Is Mr. Bickersteth's father dead, too?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Leave any money?' "'No, sir.' I began to understand why poor old Bicky was always more or less on the rocks. To the casual and irreflective observer, if you know what I mean, it may sound a pretty good wheeze having a duke for an uncle, but the trouble about old Chiswick was that, though an extremely wealthy old buster, owning half London and about five counties up north, he was notoriously the most prudent spender in England. He was what American chappies would call a hard-boiled egg. If Biggie's people hadn't left him anything, and he depended on what he could prize out of the old duke, he was in a pretty bad way. Not that that explained why he was hunting me like this, because he was a chap who never borrowed money. He said he wanted to keep his pals, so never bit anyone's ear on principle. At this juncture the doorbell rang. Jeeves floated out to answer it. "'Yes, sir. Mr. Wooster has just returned,' I heard him say. And Bicky came trickling in, looking pretty sorry for himself. "'Hello, Bicky,' I said. "'Jeeves told me you had been trying to get me. "'Jeeves, bring another glass, and let the revels commence. "'What's the trouble, Bicky?' "'I'm in a hole, Bertie. I want your advice. "'Say on, old lad. "'My uncle's turning up tomorrow, Bertie.' So Jeeves told me. The Duke of Chiswick, you know. So Jeeves told me. Bicky seemed a bit surprised. Jeeves seems to know everything. Rather rummily, that's exactly what I was thinking just now myself. Well, I wish, said Bicky gloomily, that he knew a way to get me out of the hole I'm in. Jeeves shimmered in with the glass and stuck it competently on the table. "'Mr. Bickersteth is in a bit of a hole, Jeeves,' I said, "'and wants you to rally round.' "'Very good, sir.' Vicky looked a bit doubtful. "'Well, of course you know, Bertie, "'this thing is by way of being a bit private and all that. "'I shouldn't worry about that, old top. "'I bet Jeeves knows all about it already. "'Don't you, Jeeves?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Eh?' said Bicky, rattled. I am open to correction, sir, but is not your dilemma due to the fact that you are at a loss to explain to his grace why you are in New York instead of Colorado? Vicky rocked like a jelly in a high wind. How the deuce do you know anything about it? I chanced to meet his grace's butler before he left England. He informed me that he happened to overhear his grace speaking to you on the matter, sir, as he passed the library door. Bicky gave a hollow sort of laugh. "'Well, as everybody seems to know all about it, there's no need to try to keep it dark. The old boy turfed me out, Bertie, because he said I was a brainless nincompoop. The idea was that he would give me a remittance on condition that I dashed out to some blighted locality of the name of Colorado and learned farming or ranching or whatever they call it at some bally ranch or farm or whatever it's called.' I didn't fancy the idea a bit. I should have had to ride horses and pursue cows and so forth. I hate horses. They bite at you. I was all against the scheme. At the same time, don't you know, I had to have that remittance. I get you absolutely, dear boy. Well, when I got to New York, it looked like a decent sort of place to me, so I thought it would be pretty sound notion to stop here. So I cabled to my uncle, telling him that I had dropped into a good business wheeze in the city, and wanted to chuck the ranch idea. 
He wrote back that it was all right, and here I've been ever since. He thinks I'm doing well at something or other over here. I never dreamed, don't you know, that he would ever come out here. What on earth am I to do? Jeeves, I said, what on earth is Mr. Bickersteth to do? You see, said Bicky, I had a wireless from him to say that he was coming to stay with me, to save hotel bills, I suppose. I've always given him the impression that I was living in pretty good style. I can't have him stay at my boarding house. Thought of anything, Jeeves? I said. To what extent, sir, if the question is not a delicate one, are you prepared to assist Mr. Bickersteth? I'll do anything I can for you, of course, Bicky, old man. Then, if I might make the suggestion, sir, you might lend Mr. Bickersteth— No, by Jove, said Bicky firmly. I never have touched you, Bertie, and I'm not going to start now. I may be a chump, but it's my boast that I don't owe a penny to a single soul, not counting tradesmen, of course. I was about to suggest, sir, that you might lend Mr. Bickersteth this flat. Mr. Bickersteth could give his grace the impression that he was the owner of it. With your permission, I could convey the notion that I was in Mr. Bickersteth's employment, and not in yours. You would be residing here temporarily as Mr. Bickersteth's guest. His grace would occupy the second spare bedroom. I fancy that you would find this answer satisfactorily, sir. Bicky had stopped rocking himself and was staring at Jeeves in an awed sort of way. I would advocate the dispatching of a wireless message to his grace on board the vessel, notifying him of the change of address. Mr. Bickersteth could meet his grace at the dock and proceed directly here. Will that meet the situation, sir? Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Bicky followed him with his eye to the door closed. How does he do it, Bertie? he said. I'll tell you what I think it is. I believe it's something to do with the shape of his head. Have you ever noticed his head, Bertie, old man? It sort of sticks out at the back. I hopped out of bed early next morning so as to be among those present when the old boy should arrive. I knew from experience that these ocean liners fetch up at the dock at a deucedly ungodly hour. It wasn't much after nine by the time I dressed and had my morning tea and was leaning out of the window, watching the street for Bicky and his uncle. It was one of those jolly, peaceful mornings that make a chappie wish he'd got a soul or something, and I was just brooding on life in general when I became aware of the dickens of a spade in progress down below. A taxi had driven up, and an old boy in a top hat had got out and was kicking up a frightful row about the fare. As far as I could make out, he was trying to get the cab chappie to switch from New York to London prices, and the cab chappie had apparently never heard of London before, and didn't seem to think a lot of it now. The old boy said that in London the trip would have set him back eightpence, and the cabbie said he should worry. I called to Jeeves. The old duke has arrived, Jeeves. Yes, sir. That'll be him at the door now. Jeeves made a long arm and opened the front door, and the old boy crawled in, looking licked to a splinter. "'How do you do, sir?' I said, bustling up and being the ray of sunshine. "'Your nephew went down to the dock to meet you, but you must have missed him. My name's Wooster, don't you know? Great pal of Bicky's and all that sort of thing. I'm staying with him, you know. Would you like a cup of tea? Jeeves, bring a cup of tea.' Old Chiswick had sunk into an armchair and was looking about the room. "'Does this luxury flat belong to my nephew Francis?' "'Absolutely. It must be terribly expensive.' "'Pretty well, of course. Everything costs a lot over here, you know,' he moaned. Jeeves filtered in with the tea. Old Chiswick took a stab at it to restore his tissues, and nodded. "'A terrible country, Mr. Wooster.' terrible country. Nearly eight shillings for a short cab drive. Iniquitous. He took another look around the room. It seemed to fascinate him. Have you any idea how much my nephew pays for this flat, Mr. Wooster? About two hundred dollars a month, I believe. What? Forty pounds a month? I began to see that, unless I made the thing a bit more plausible, 
the scheme might turn out a frost. I could guess what the old boy was thinking. He was trying to square all this prosperity with what he knew of poor old Bicky. And one had to admit that it took a lot of squaring, for dear old Bicky, though a stout fellow and absolutely unrivaled as an imitator of bull terriers and cats, was in many ways one of the most pronounced fatheads that ever pulled on a suit of gents' underwear. "'I suppose it seems rummy to you,' I said, "'but the fact is New York often bucks chappies up and makes them show a flash of speed that you wouldn't have imagined them capable of. It sort of develops them. Something in the air, don't you know? I imagine that Bicky in the past, when you knew him, may have been something of a chump. But it's quite different now.' devilish efficient sort of chappy, and looked in on commercial circles as quite the nib. I'm amazed. What is the nature of my nephew's business, Mr. Wooster? Oh, just business, don't you know? The same sort of thing Carnegie and Rockefeller and all those coves do, you know. I slid for the door. Awfully sorry to leave you, but I've got to meet some of the lads elsewhere. Coming out of the lift, I met Bicky bustling in from the street. "'Hello, Bertie. I missed him. Has he turned up?' "'He's upstairs now, having some tea.' "'What does he think of it all?' "'He's absolutely rattled.' "'Ripping. I'll be toddling up, then. Toodaloo, Bertie, old man. See you later. Pip-pip, Bicky, dear boy.' He trotted off, full of merriment and good cheer, and I went off to the club to sit in the window and watch the traffic coming up one way and going down the other. It was latish in the evening when I looked in at the flat to dress for dinner. "'Where's everybody, Jeeves?' I said, finding no little feet pattering about the place. "'Gone out?' "'His Grace desired to see some of the sights of the city, sir. Mr. Bickersteth is acting as his escort. I fancy their immediate objective was Grant's tomb.' I suppose Mr. Bickersteth is a bit braced up the way things are going, what? Sir? I say, I take it that Mr. Bickersteth is tolerably full of beans. Not altogether, sir. What's his trouble now? The scheme which I took the liberty of suggesting to Mr. Bickersteth and yourself has, unfortunately, not answered entirely satisfactorily, sir. Surely the Duke believes that Mr. Bickersteth is doing well in business, and all that sort of thing? Exactly, sir, with the result that he has decided to cancel Mr. Bickersteth's monthly allowance, on the ground that, as Mr. Bickersteth is doing so well on his own account, he no longer requires pecuniary assistance. Great Scott, Jeeves, this is awful! Somewhat disturbing, sir. I never expected anything like this! I confess, I scarcely anticipated the contingency myself, sir. I suppose it bowled the poor blighter over, absolutely. Mr. Bickersteth appeared somewhat taken aback, sir. My heart bled for Bicky. We must do something, Jeeves. Yes, sir. Can you think of anything? Not at the moment, sir. There must be something we can do. It was a maxim of one of my former employers, sir, as I believe I mentioned to you once before, the present Lord Bridgenorth, that there is always a way. I remember his lordship using the expression on the occasion he was then a business gentleman and had not yet received his title, when a patent hair restorer, which he chanced to be promoting, failed to attract the public. He put it on the market under another name, as a depilatory, and amassed a substantial fortune. I have generally found his lordship's aphorism based on sound foundations. No doubt we shall be able to discover some solution of Mr. Bickersteth's difficulty, sir. Well, have a stab at it, Jeeves. I will spare no pains, sir. I went and dressed sadly. It will show you pretty well how pipped I was when I tell you that I near as toucher put on a white tie with a dinner jacket. I sallied out for a bit of food more to pass the time than because I wanted it. It seemed brutal to be wading into the bill of fare with poor old Bicky headed for the bread line. When I got back old Chiswick had gone to bed, but Bicky was there, 
hunched up in an armchair, brooding pretty intensely, with a cigarette hanging out of the corner of his mouth and a more or less glassy stare in his eyes. He had the aspect of one who had been soaked with what the newspaper chappies called some blunt instrument. "'This is a bit thick, old thing, what?' I said. He picked up his glass and drained it feverishly, overlooking the fact that it hadn't anything in it. "'I'm done, Bertie,' he said. He had another go at the glass. It didn't seem to do him any good. If only this had happened a week later, Bertie. My next month's money was due to roll in on Saturday. I could have worked a wheeze I'd been reading about in the magazine advertisements. It seems that you can make a dashed amount of money if you can only collect a few dollars and start a chicken farm. Jolly sound scheme, Bertie. Say you buy a hen. Call it one hen for the sake of argument. It lays an egg every day of the week. You sell the eggs seven for twenty-five cents. Keep of hen costs nothing. Profit practically twenty-five cents on every seven eggs. Or look at it another way. Suppose you have a dozen eggs. Each of the hens has a dozen chickens. The chickens grow up and have more chickens. Why, in no time you'd have the place covered knee-deep in hens, all laying eggs, at twenty-five cents for every seven. You'd make a fortune. Jolly life, too, keeping hens. He began to get quite worked up at the thought of it, but he slopped back in his chair at this juncture with a good deal of gloom. But, of course, it's no good, he said, because I haven't got the cash. You've only got to say the word, you know, Bicky, old top. Thanks awfully, Bertie, but I'm not going to sponge on you. That's always the way of this world. The chappies you'd like to lend money to won't let you whereas the chappies you don't want to lend it to will do everything except actually stand on your head and lift the specie out of your pockets. As a lad who's always rolled tolerably free in the right stuff, I've had lots of experience of the second class. Many's the time, back in London, I've hurried along Piccadilly and felt the hot breath of a toucher on the back of my neck and heard his sharp, excited yapping as he closed in on me. I've simply spent my life scattering largesse to blighters I didn't care a hang for. Yet here I was now, dripping doubloons and pieces of eight, and longing to hand them over, and Bicky, poor fish, absolutely on his uppers, not taking any at any price. Well, there's only one hope, then. What's that? Jeeves, sir. There was Jeeves, standing behind me, full of zeal. In this matter of shimmering into rooms, the chappie is rummy to a degree. You're sitting in the old armchair, thinking of this and that, and then suddenly you look up, and there he is. He moves from point to point with as little uproar as a jellyfish. The thing startled poor old Bicky considerably. He rose from his seat like a rocketing pheasant. I'm used to Jeeves now. But often in the days when he first came into me, I've bitten my tongue freely on finding him unexpectedly in my midst. Did you call, sir? Oh, there you are, Jeeves. Precisely, sir. Jeeves, Mr. Bickersteth is still up the pole. Any ideas? Why, yes, sir. Since we had our recent conversation, I fancy I have found what may prove a solution. I do not wish to appear to be taking a liberty, sir, but I think that we have overlooked His Grace's potentialities as a source of revenue. Bicky laughed, what I have sometimes seen described as a hollow, mocking laugh, a sort of bitter cackle from the back of the throat, rather like a gargle. I do not allude, sir, explained Jeeves, to the possibility of inducing His Grace to part with money. I am taking the liberty of regarding His Grace in the light of an, at present, if I may say so, useless property, which is capable of being developed. Bicky looked at me in a helpless kind of way. I'm bound to say I didn't get it myself. Couldn't you make it a bit easier, Jeeves? In a nutshell, sir, what I mean is this. His Grace is, in a sense, a prominent personage. The inhabitants of this country, as no doubt you are aware, sir, are peculiarly addicted to shaking hands with prominent personages. 
It occurred to me that Mr. Bickersteth or yourself might know of persons who would be willing to pay a small fee, let us say two dollars or three, for the privilege of an introduction, including handshake to his grace. Vicky didn't seem to think much of it. Do you mean to say that any one would be mug enough to part with solid cash just to shake hands with my uncle? I have an aunt, sir, who paid five shillings to a young fellow for bringing a moving picture actor to tea at her house one Sunday. It gave her social standing among the neighbors. Bicky wavered. If you think it could be done, I feel convinced of it, sir. What do you think, Bertie? I'm for it, old boy, absolutely. A very brainy wheeze. Thank you, sir. Will there be anything further? Good night, sir. And he floated out, leaving us to discuss the details. Until we started this business of floating old Chiswick as a money-making proposition, I had never realized what a perfectly foul time those stock exchange chappies must have when the public isn't biting freely. Nowadays I read that bit they put in the financial reports about the market opened quietly with a sympathetic eye, for, by Jove, it certainly opened quietly for us. You'd hardly believe how difficult it was to interest the public and make them take a flutter on the old boy. By the end of the week, the only name we had on our list was a delicatessen storekeeper down in Bicky's part of the town, and, as he wanted us to take it out in sliced ham instead of cash, that didn't help much. There was a gleam of light when the brother of Biggie's pawnbroker offered ten dollars, money down, for an introduction to old Chiswick, but the deal fell through, owing to its turning out that the chap was an anarchist, and intended to kick the old boy instead of shaking hands with him. At that, it took me the deuce of a time to persuade Bicky not to grab the cash and let things take their course. He seemed to regard the pawnbroker's brother rather as a sportsman and benefactor of his species than otherwise. The whole thing, I'm inclined to think, would have been off if it hadn't been for Jeeves. There is no doubt that Jeeves is in a class of his own. In the matter of brain and resource, I don't think I have ever met a chappie so supremely like Mother Maid. He trickled into my room one morning with a good old cup of tea, and intimated that there was something doing. "'Might I speak to you with regard to the matter of his grace, sir?' "'It's all off. We've decided to chuck it. Sir? It won't work. We can't get anybody to come. I fancy I can arrange that aspect of the matter, sir. Do you mean to say you've managed to get anybody?' "'Yes, sir.' Eighty-seven gentlemen from Birdsburg, sir. I sat up in bed and spilt the tea. Birdsburg? Birdsburg, Missouri, sir. How did you get them? I happened last night, sir, as you had intimated that you would be absent from home, to attend a theatrical performance, and entered into conversation between the acts with the occupant of the adjoining seat. I had observed that he was wearing a somewhat ornate decoration in his buttonhole, sir, a large blue button with the words Boost for Birdsburg on it in red letters, scarcely a judicious addition to a gentleman's evening costume. To my surprise, I noticed that the auditorium was full of persons similarly decorated. I ventured to inquire the explanation, and was informed that these gentlemen, forming a party of eighty-seven, are a convention from a town of the name of Birdsburg. I ventured to inquire the explanation, and was informed that these gentlemen, forming a party of eighty-seven, are a convention from a town of the name of Birdsburg in the state of Missouri. Their visit, I gathered, was purely of a social and pleasurable nature, and my informant spoke at some length of the entertainments arranged for their stay in the city. It was when he related with a considerable amount of satisfaction and pride that a deputation of their number had been introduced to and had shaken hands with a well-known prize-fighter that it occurred to me to broach the subject of his grace. To make a long story short, sir, I have arranged, subject to your approval, that the entire convention shall be presented to his grace tomorrow afternoon. I was amazed. This chappie was a Napoleon. Eighty-seven, Jeeves, 
at how much a head? I was obliged to agree to a reduction for a quantity, sir. The terms finally arrived at were one hundred and fifty dollars for the party. I thought a bit. Payable in advance? No, sir. I endeavored to obtain payment in advance, but was not successful. Well, anyway, when we get it, I'll make it up to five hundred. Bicky'll never know. Do you suspect Mr. Bickersteth would suspect anything, Jeeves, if I made it up to five hundred? I fancy not, sir. Mr. Bickersteth is an agreeable gentleman, but not bright. All right, then. After breakfast, run down to the bank and get me some money. Yes, sir. You know, you're a bit of a marvel, Jeeves. Thank you, sir. Right-o. Very good, sir. When I took dear old Bicky aside in the course of the morning and told him what had happened, he nearly broke down. He tottered into the sitting-room and buttonholed old Chiswick, who was reading the comic section of the morning paper with a kind of grim resolution. "'Uncle,' he said, "'are you doing anything special tomorrow afternoon? I mean to say, I've asked a few of my pals in to meet you, don't you know?' The old boy cocked a speculative eye at him. "'There will be no reporters among them.' "'Reporters? Rather not. Why?' I refuse to be badgered by reporters. There were a number of adhesive young men who endeavored to elicit from me my views on America while the boat was approaching the dock. I will not be subjected to this persecution again. That'll be absolutely all right, Uncle. There won't be a newspaper man in the place. In that case, I shall be glad to make the acquaintance of your friends. You'll shake hands with them and so forth? I shall naturally order my behavior according to the accepted rules of civilized intercourse. Bicky thanked him heartily and came off to lunch with me at the club, where he babbled freely of hens, incubators, and other rotten things. After mature consideration, we had decided to unleash the Birdsburg contingent on the old boy ten at a time. Jeeves brought his theater pal round to see us, and we arranged the whole thing with him. A very decent chappy but rather inclined to color the conversation and turn it into the direction of his hometown's new water supply system. We settled that, as an hour was about all he would be likely to stand, each gang should consider itself entitled to seven minutes of the Duke's society by Jeeves' stopwatch, and that when their time was up, Jeeves would slide into the room and cough meaningly. Then we parted with what I believe are called mutual expressions of goodwill, the Birdsburg chappy extending a cordial invitation to us all to pop out some day and take a look at the new water supply system, for which we thanked him. Next day the deputation rolled in. The first shift consisted of the cove we had met and nine others almost exactly like him in every respect. They all looked deuced keen and businesslike, as if from youth up they had been working in the office and catching the boss's eye and what not. They shook hands with the old boy with a good deal of apparent satisfaction, all except one chappie who seemed to be brooding about something, and then they stood off and became chatty. "'What message have you for Birdsburg, Duke?' asked our pal. The old boy seemed a bit rattled. "'I have never been to Birdsburg.' Chappie seemed pained. "'You should pay it a visit,' he said. "'The most rapidly growing city in the country. Boost for Birdsburg!' "'Boost for Birdsburg!' said the other chappies reverently. The chappie who had been brooding suddenly gave tongue. "'Say!' He was a stout sort of well-fed cove with one of those determined chins and a cold eye. The assemblage looked at him. "'As a matter of business,' said the chappie, "'mind you, I'm not questioning anybody's good faith, but as a matter of strict business—' I think this gentleman here ought to put himself on record before witnesses as stating that he really is a duke. "'What do you mean, sir?' cried the old boy, getting purple. "'No offense. Simply business. I'm not saying anything, mind you, but there's one thing that seems kind of funny to me. This gentleman here says his name's Mr. Bickersteth, as I understand it. Well, if you're the Duke of Chiswick, why isn't he Lord Percy something? I've read English novels, and I know all about it.' This is monstrous. Now don't get hot under the collar. I'm only asking. I have a right to know. You're going to take our money, so it's only fair that we should see that we get our money's worth. The water-supplied cove chipped in. You're quite right, Sims. I overlooked that when making the agreement. 
You see, gentlemen, as businessmen, we've a right to reasonable guarantees of good faith. We're paying Mr. Bickersteth here $150 for this reception, and we naturally want to know. Old Chiswick gave Bicky a searching look. Then he turned to the water supply chappy. He was frightfully calm. I can assure you that I know nothing of this, he said, quite politely. I should be grateful if you would explain. Well, we arranged with Mr. Bickersteth that 87 citizens of Birdsburg should have the privilege of meeting and shaking hands with you for a financial consideration mutually arranged. And what my friend Sims here means, and I'm with him, is that we have only Mr. Bickersteth's word for it, and he is a stranger to us, that you are the Duke of Chiswick at all. Old Chiswick gulped. Allow me to assure you, sir, he said in a rummy kind of voice, that I am the Duke of Chiswick. Then that's all right, said the chappy heartily. That was all we wanted to know. Let the thing go on. I am sorry to say, said old Chiswick, that it cannot go on. I am feeling a little tired. I fear I must ask to be excused. But there are eighty-seven of the boys waiting around the corner at this moment, Duke, to be introduced to you. I fear I must disappoint them. But in that case, the deal would have to be off. That is a matter for you and my nephew to discuss. The chappie seemed troubled. You really won't meet the rest of them? No. Well, then, I guess we'll be going. They went out, and there was a pretty solid silence. Then old Chiswick turned to Bicky. Well, Bicky didn't seem to have anything to say. Was it true what that man said? Yes, uncle. What do you mean by playing this trick? Bicky seemed pretty well knocked out, so I put in a word. I think you better explain the whole thing, Bicky, old top. Bicky's Adam's apple jumped about a bit, then he started. You see, you had cut off my allowance, uncle, and I wanted a bit of money to start a chicken farm. I mean to say, it's an absolute cert if you once get a bit of capital. You buy a hen, and it lays an egg every day of the week, and you sell the egg, say, seven for twenty-five cents. Keep of the hens costs nothing. Profit, practically. What is all this nonsense about hens? You led me to suppose you are a substantial businessman. Old Bicky rather exaggerated, sir, I said, helping the chappy out. The fact is, the poor old lad is absolutely dependent on that remittance of yours, and when you cut it off, don't you know, he was pretty solidly in the soup, and had to think of some way of closing in on a bit of the ready pretty quick. That's why we thought of this handshaking scheme. Old Chiswick foamed at the mouth. So you have lied to me. You have deliberately deceived me as to your financial status. Poor old Bicky didn't want to go to that ranch, I explained. He doesn't like cows and horses, but he rather thinks he would be hot stuff among the hens. All he wants is a bit of capital. Don't you think it'd be rather a wheeze if you were to, after what has happened? After this? This deceit and foolery? Not a penny. But not a penny. There was a respectful cough in the background. If I might make a suggestion, sir. Jeeves was standing on the horizon, looking devilish brainy. Go ahead, Jeeves, I said. I would merely suggest, sir, that if Mr. Bickersteth is in need of a little ready money, and is at a loss to obtain it elsewhere, he might secure the sum he requires by describing the occurrences of this afternoon for the Sunday issue of one of the more spirited and enterprising newspapers. By Jove, I said. By George, said Bicky. Great heavens, said old Cheswick. Very good, sir, said Jeeves. Bicky turned to old Cheswick with a gleaming eye. Jeeves is right. I'll do it. The Chronicle would jump at it. They eat that sort of stuff. Old Chiswick gave a kind of moaning howl. I absolutely forbid you, Francis, to do this thing. That's all very well, said Bicky, wonderfully braced. But if I can't get the money any other way, wait. Er, wait, my boy. You are so impetuous. We might arrange something. I won't go to that bally ranch. No, no, 
No, no, my boy. I would not suggest it. I would not for a moment suggest it. I, I think... He seemed to have a bit of a struggle with himself. I, I think that, on the whole, it would be best if you returned with me to England. I, I might... In fact, I think I see my way to doing, to... I might be able to utilize your services in some secretarial position. I shouldn't mind that. I should not be able to offer you a salary, but as you know in English political life, the unpaid secretary is a recognized figure. The only figure I'll recognize, said Bicky firmly, is five hundred quid a year, paid quarterly. My dear boy, absolutely. But your recompense, my dear Francis, would consist in the unrivaled opportunities you would have as my secretary to gain experience, to accustom yourself to the intricacies of political life, to, in fact, you would be in an exceedingly advantageous position. Five hundred a year, said Bicky, rolling it round his tongue. Why, that would be nothing to what I could make if I started a chicken farm. It stands to reason. Suppose you have a dozen hens. Each of the hens has a dozen chickens. After a bit, the chickens grow up and have a dozen chickens each themselves. And then they all start laying eggs. There's a fortune in it. You can get anything you like for eggs in America. Chappies keep them on ice for years and years and don't sell them till they fetch about a dollar a whirl. You'd think I'm going to chuck a future like this for anything under five hundred of goblins a year? What? A look of anguish passed over old Chiswick's face. Then he seemed to be resigned to it. Very well, my boy, he said. What ho, said Bicky. All right, then. Jeeves, I said. Bicky had taken the old boy off to dinner to celebrate, and we were alone. Jeeves, this has been one of your best efforts. Thank you, sir. It beats me how you do it. Yes, sir. The only trouble is, you haven't got much out of it, what? I fancy Mr. Bickersteth intends, I judge from his remarks, to signify his appreciation of anything I have been fortunate enough to do to assist him at some later date when he is in a more favorable position to do so. It isn't enough, Jeeves, sir. It was a wrench, but I felt it was the only possible thing to be done. Bring my shaving things. A gleam of hope shone in the chappie's eyes, mixed with doubt. You mean, sir, and shave off my mustache. There was a moment's silence. I could see the fellow was deeply moved. Thank you very much indeed, sir, he said in a low voice, and popped off. End of Jeeves and the Hard-Boiled Egg My Man Jeeves by P. G. Wodehouse Four Absent Treatment I want to tell you all about my dear old Bobby Cardew. It's a most interesting story. I can't put in any literary style and all that, but I don't have to, don't you know, because it goes on its moral lesson. If you're a man, you mustn't miss it, because it'll be a warning to you. And if you're a woman, you won't want to, because it's all about how a girl made a man feel pretty well fed up with things. If you're a recent acquaintance of Bobby's, you'll probably be surprised to hear that there was a time when he was more remarkable for the weakness of his memory than anything else. Dozens of fellows who have only met Bobby once since the change took place have been surprised when I told them that. Yes, it's true. Believe me. In the days when I first knew him, Bobby Cardew was about the most pronounced young rotter inside the four-mile radius. People have called me a silly ass, but I was never in the same class with Bobby. When it came to being a silly ass, he was a plus-four man, while my handicap was about six. Why, if I wanted him to dine with me, I used to post him a letter at the beginning of the week, and then the day before send him a telegram and a phone call on the day itself, and, half an hour before the time we'd fixed, a messenger in a taxi, whose business it was to see that he got in and that the chauffeur had the address all correct. By doing this, I generally managed to get him, unless he had left town before my messenger arrived. 
The funny thing was that he wasn't altogether a fool in other ways. Deep down in him there was a kind of stratum of sense. I had known him, once or twice, show an almost human intelligence. But to reach that stratum, mind you, you needed dynamite. At least, that's what I thought. But there was another way which hadn't occurred to me. Marriage, I mean. Marriage, the dynamite of the soul. That was what hit Bobby. He married. Have you ever seen a bull pup chasing a bee? The pup sees the bee. It looks good to him. But he still doesn't know what's at the end of it till he gets there. It was like that with Bobby. He fell in love, got married with a sort of whoop, as if it were the greatest fun in the world, and then began to find out things. She wasn't the sort of girl you would have expected Bobby to rave about, and yet, I don't know, what I mean is, she worked for her living, and to a fellow who has never done a hand's turn in his life, there's undoubtedly a sort of fascination, a kind of romance about a girl who works for her living. Her name was Anthony, Mary Anthony. She was about five feet six. She had a ton and a half of red-gold hair, gray eyes, and one of those determined chins. She was a hospital nurse. When Bobby smashed himself up at Polo, she was told off by the authorities to smooth his brow and rally round with cooling unguents and all like that and the old boy hadn't been up and about again for more than a week before they'd popped off to the Red Stars and fixed it up. Quite the romance. Bobby broke the news to me at the club one evening, and the next day he introduced me to her. I admired her. I've never worked myself. My name's Pepper, by the way. Almost forgot to mention it. Reggie Pepper. My Uncle Edward was Pepper Wells and Company, the colliery people. He left me a sizable chunk of bullion. I say I've never worked myself, but I admire anyone who earns a living under difficulties, especially a girl. And this girl had a rather unusual time of it, being an orphan and all that, and having had to do everything off her own bat for years. Mary and I got along splendidly. We don't now, but we'll come to that later. I'm speaking of the past. She seemed to think Bobby the greatest thing on earth, judging by the way she looked at him when she thought I wasn't noticing, and Bobby seemed to think the same about her. So that I came to the conclusion that, if only dear old Bobby didn't forget to go to the wedding, they had a sporting chance of being quite happy. Well, let's brisk it up a bit here and jump a year. The story doesn't really start till then. They took a flat and settled down. I was in and out of the place quite a good deal. I kept my eyes open, and everything seemed to me to be running along as smoothly as you could want. If this was marriage, I thought, I couldn't see why fellows were so frightened of it. There were a lot worse things that could happen to a man. But we now come to the incident of the quiet dinner, and it's just here that love's young dream hits a snag, and things begin to occur. I happened to meet Bobby in Piccadilly, and he asked me to come back to dinner at the flat. And, like a fool, instead of bolting and putting myself under police protection, I went. When we got to the flat, there was Mrs. Bobby looking, well, I tell you, it staggered me. Her gold hair was all piled up in waves and crinkles and things, with a what-you-call-it of diamonds in it, and she was wearing the most perfectly ripping dress. I couldn't begin to describe it. I can only say it was the limit. It struck me that if this was how she was in the habit of looking every night when they were dining quietly at home together, it was no wonder that Bobby liked domesticity. "'Here's old Reggie, dear,' said Bobby. "'I brought him home to have a bit of dinner. I'll phone down to the kitchen and ask them to send it up now, what?' She stared at him as if she had never seen him before. Then she turned scarlet. Then she turned white as a sheet. Then she gave a little laugh. It was most interesting to watch. Made me wish I was up a tree about eight hundred miles away. Then she recovered herself. I'm so glad you were able to come, Mr. Pepper, she said, smiling at me. And after that she was all right. At least you would have said so. She talked a lot at dinner and chafed Bobby. 
and played us ragtime on the piano afterwards, as if she hadn't a care in the world. Quite a jolly little party it was. Not. I'm no lynx-eyed sleuth and all that sort of thing, but I had seen her face at the beginning, and I knew that she was working the whole time and working hard to keep herself in hand, and that she would have given that diamond what's-its-name in her hair and everything else she possessed to have one good scream, just one. I've sat through some pretty thick evenings in my time, but that one had the rest beaten in a canter. At the very earliest moment I grabbed my hat and got away. Having seen what I did, I wasn't particularly surprised to meet Bobby at the club next day, looking about as merry and bright as a lonely gumdrop at an Eskimo tea party. We started in straight away. He seemed glad to have someone to talk about it. "'Do you know how long I've been married?' he said. I didn't exactly. "'About a year, isn't it?' "'Not about a year,' he said sadly. "'Exactly a year. Yesterday.' Then I understood. I saw a light, a regular flash of light. Yesterday was the anniversary of the wedding. I'd arranged to take Mary to the Savoy and on to Covent Garden. She particularly wanted to hear Caruso. I had the ticket for the box in my pocket. Do you know, all through dinner I had a kind of rummy idea that there was something I'd forgotten, but I couldn't think what. Till your wife mentioned it? He nodded. She mentioned it, he said thoughtfully. I didn't ask for details. Women with hair and chins like Mary's may be angels most of the time, but when they take off their wings for a bit, they aren't half-hearted about it. To be absolutely frank, old top, said poor old Bobby, in a broken sort of way, my stock's pretty low at home. There didn't seem much to be done. I just lit a cigarette and sat there. He didn't want to talk. Presently he went out. I stood at the window of our upper smoking room, which looks out onto Piccadilly, and watched him. He walked slowly along for a few yards, stopped, then walked on again, and finally turned into a jeweler's. Which is an instant of what I mean when I say that deep down in him there was a certain stratum of sense. It was from now on that I began to be really interested in this problem of Bobby's married life. Of course, one's always mildly interested in one's friends' marriages, hoping they'll turn out well and all that, but this was different. The average man isn't like Bobby, and the average girl isn't like Mary. It was like that old business of the immovable mass and the irresistible force. There was Bobby, ambling gently through life, a dear old chap in a hundred ways, but undoubtedly a chump of the first water. And there was Mary, determined that he shouldn't be a chump, and nature, mind you, on Bobby's side. When nature makes a chump like dear old Bobby, she's proud of him, and doesn't want her handiwork disturbed. She gives him a sort of natural armor to protect him against outside interference. And that armor is shortness of memory. Shortness of memory keeps a man a chump, when, but for it, he might cease to be one. Take my case, for instance. I'm a chump. Well, if I had remembered half the things people have tried to teach me during my life, my size in hats would be about number nine. But I didn't. I forgot them. And it was just the same with Bobby. For about a week, perhaps a bit more, the recollection of that quiet little domestic evening bucked him up like a tonic. Elephants, I read somewhere, are champions at the memory business, but they were fools to Bobby during that week. But, bless you, the shock wasn't nearly big enough. It had dented the armor, but it hadn't made a hole in it. Pretty soon he was back at the old game. It was pathetic, don't you know? The poor girl loved him, and she was frightened. It was the thin edge of the wedge, you see, and she knew it. A man who forgets what day he was married, when he's been married one year, will forget, at about the end of the fourth, that he's married at all. If she meant to get him in hand at all, she had got to do it now, before he began to drift away. 
I saw that clearly enough, and I tried to make Bobby see it, when he was by way of pouring out his troubles to me one afternoon. I can't remember what it was that he had forgotten the day before, but it was something she had asked him to bring home for her. It may have been a book. It's such a little thing to fuss about, said Bobby, and she knows it simply because I've got such an infernal memory about everything. I can't remember anything. Never could. He talked on for a while, and just as he was going, he pulled out a couple of sovereigns. Oh, by the way, he said, what's this for? I asked, though I knew. I owe it to you. How's that? I said. Why, that bet on Tuesday. In the billiard room? Murray and Brown were playing a hundred up, and I gave you two to one that Brown would win, and Murray beat him by twenty odd. So you do remember some things, I said. He got quite excited, said that if I thought he was the sort of rotter who forgot to pay when he lost a bet, it was pretty rotten of me after knowing him all these years, and a lot more like that. Subside, laddie, I said. Then I spoke to him like a father. What you've got to do, my old college chum, I said, is to pull yourself together, and jolly quick, too. As things are shaping, you're due for a nasty knock before you know what's hit you. You've got to make an effort. Don't say you can't. This two-quid business shows that, even if your memory is rocky, you can remember some things. What you've got to do is to see that wedding anniversaries and so on are included on the list. It may be a brain strain, but you can't get out of it. I suppose you're right, said Bobby. But it beats me why she thinks such a lot of these rotten little dates. What's it matter if I forgot what day we were married on, or what day she was born on, or, or what day the cat had the measles? She knows I love her just as much as if I were a memorizing freak at the halls. That's not enough for a woman, I said. They want to be shown. Bear that in mind, and you'll be all right. Forget it, and there'll be trouble. He chewed the knob of his stick. Women are frightfully rummy, he said gloomily. You should have thought of that before you married one, I said. I don't see that I could have done any more. I'd put the whole thing in a nutshell for him. You would have thought he would have seen the point, and that it would have made him brace up and get a hold of himself. But no. Off he went again in the same old way. I gave up arguing with him. I had a good deal of time on my hands, but not enough to amount to anything when it was a question of reforming dear old Bobby by argument. If you see a man asking for trouble, and insisting on getting it, the only thing to do is to stand by and wait till it comes to him. After that you may get a chance. But till then there's nothing to be done. But I thought a lot about him. Bobby didn't get into the soup all at once. Weeks went by, and months, and still nothing happened. Now and then he'd come into the club with a kind of cloud on his shiny morning face, and I'd known that there had been doings in the home, but it wasn't till well on in the spring that he got the thunderbolt, just where he'd been asking for it, in the thorax. I was smoking a quiet cigarette one morning on the window looking out over Piccadilly, and watching the buses and motors going up one way and down the other. Most interesting it is, I often do it when in rushed Bobby, with his eyes bulging and his face the color of an oyster, waving a piece of paper in his hand. "'Reggie,' he said. "'Reggie, old top, she's gone.' "'Gone,' I said. "'Who?' "'Mary, of course. Gone. Left me. Gone.' "'Where?' I said. "'Silly question. Perhaps you're right. Anyhow, dear old Bobby nearly foamed at the mouth. "'Where?' How should I know where? Here, read this. He pushed the paper into my hand. It was a letter. Go on, said Bobby. Read it. So I did. It certainly was quite a letter. There was not much of it, but it was all to the point. This is what it said. My dear Bobby, I am going away. When you care enough about me to remember to wish me many happy returns on my birthday, I will come back. My address will be Box 341, London Morning News. I read it twice. Then I said, 
Well, why don't you? Why don't I what? Why don't you wish her many happy returns? It doesn't seem much to ask. But she says on her birthday. Well, when is her birthday? Can't you understand, said Bobby. I've forgotten. Forgotten, I said. Yes, said Bobby. Forgotten. What do you mean, forgotten, I said. Forgotten whether it's the twentieth or the twenty-first, or what? How near do you get to it? I know it came somewhere between the first of January and the thirty-first of December. That's how near I get to it. Think. Think? What's the use of saying think? Think I haven't thought? I've been knocking sparks out of my brain ever since I opened that letter. And you can't remember? No. I rang the bell and ordered restoratives. Well, Bobby, I said, it's a pretty hard case to spring on an untrained amateur like me. Suppose someone had come to Sherlock Holmes and said, Mr. Holmes, here's a case for you. When is my wife's birthday? Wouldn't that have given Sherlock a jolt? However, I know enough about the game to understand that a fellow can't shoot off his deductive theories unless you start him with a clue. So rouse yourself out of that pop-eyed trance and come across with two or three. For instance, can't you remember the last time she had a birthday? What sort of weather was it? That might fix the month. Bobby shook his head. It was just ordinary weather, as near as I can recollect. Warm? Warmish? Or cold? Well, well, fairly cold, I perhaps. I can't remember. I ordered two more of the same. They seemed indicated in the young detective's manual. You're a great help, Bobby, I said, an invaluable assistant, one of those indispensable adjuncts without which no home is complete. Bobby seemed to be thinking. I've got it, he said suddenly. Look here, I gave her a present on her last birthday. All we have to do is go to the shop, hunt up the date when it was bought, and the thing's done. Absolutely. What did you give her? He sagged. I can't remember, he said. Getting ideas is like golf. Some days you're right off. Others, it's as easy as falling off a log. I don't suppose dear old Bobby had ever had two ideas in the same morning before in his life. But now he did it without an effort. He just loosed another dry martini into the undergrowth, and before you could turn around, it had flushed quite a brain wave. Do you know those little books called When You Were Born? There's one for each month. They tell you your character, your talents, your strong points, and your weak points at four pence halfpenny a go. Bobby's idea was to buy the whole twelve and go through them till we found out which month hit off Mary's character. That would give us the month and narrow it down a whole lot. A pretty hot idea for a non-thinker like dear old Bobby. We sallied out at once. He took half, and I took half, and we settled down to work. As I say, it sounded good, but when we came into the thing, we saw that there was a flaw. There was plenty of information, all right, but there wasn't a single month that didn't have something that exactly hit off Mary. For instance, in the December book it said, December people are apt to keep their own secrets. They are extensive travelers. Well, Mary had certainly kept her secret, and she had traveled quite extensively enough for Bobby's needs. Then October people were born with original ideas and loved moving. You couldn't have summed up Mary's little jaunt more neatly. February people had wonderful memories. Mary's speciality. We took a bit of a rest, then had another go at the thing. Bobby was all for May, because the book said that women born in that month were inclined to be capricious, which is always a barrier to a happy married life. But I plumped for February, because February women are unusually determined to have their own way, are very earnest, and expect a full return in their companion or mates. Which he owned was about as like Mary as anything could be. In the end he tore the books up, stamped on them, burnt them, and went home. It was wonderful what a change the next few days made in dear old Bobby. 
Have you ever seen that picture, The Soul's Awakening? It represents a flapper of sorts, gazing in a startled sort of way into the middle distance, with a look in her eyes that seems to say, Surely that is George's step I hear on the mat. Can this be love? Well, Bobby had a soul's awakening, too. I don't suppose he had ever troubled to think in his life before, not really think. But now he was wearing his brain to the bone. It was painful in a way, of course, to see a fellow human being so thoroughly in the soup, and I felt strongly that it was all for the best. I could see as plainly as possible that all these brainstorms were improving Bobby out of knowledge. When it was all over, he might possibly become a rotter again of a sort, but it would only be a pale reflection of the rotter he had been. It bore out the idea I had always had that what he needed was a really good jolt. I saw a great deal of him these days. I was his best friend, and he came to me for sympathy. I gave it to him, too, with both hands, but I never failed to hand him the moral lesson when I had him weak. One day he came to me as I was sitting in the club, and I could see that he had had an idea. He looked happier than he'd done in weeks. "'Reggie,' he said, "'I'm on the trail. This time I'm convinced that I shall pull it off. I've remembered something of vital importance.' "'Yes,' I said. "'I remember distinctly,' he said, "'that on Mary's last birthday we went together to the Colosseum. How does that hit you?' It's a fine bit of memorizing, I said, but how does it help? Why, they change the program every week there. Ah, I said, now you're talking. And the week we went, one of the turns was Professor Someone's Tripsichorean Cats. I recollect them distinctly. Now, are we narrowing it down, or aren't we, Reggie? I'm going round to the Colosseum this minute and I'm going to dig the date of those Terpsichorean cats out of them if I have to use a crowbar. So that got him within six days, for the management treated us like brothers, brought out the archives, and ran agile fingers over the pages till they treed the cats in the middle of May. I told you it was May, said Bobby. Maybe you'll listen to me another time. If you've any sense, I said, there won't be another time. And Bobby said that there wouldn't. Once you get your money on the run, it parts as if it enjoyed doing it. I had just got off to sleep that night when my telephone bell rang. It was Bobby, of course. He didn't apologize. Reggie, he said, I've got it now for certain. It's just come to me. We saw those Terpsichorean cats at a matinee, old man. Yes, I said. Well, don't you see that that brings it down to two days? It must have been either Wednesday the 7th or Saturday the 10th. Yes, I said, if they didn't have daily matinees at the Coliseum. I heard him give a sort of howl. Bobby, I said, my feet were freezing, but I was fond of him. Well, I've remembered something, too. It's this. The day you went to the Coliseum, I lunched with you both at the Ritz. You had forgotten to bring any money with you, so you wrote a check. But I'm always writing checks. You are, but this was for a tenor and made out to the hotel. Hunt up your checkbook and see how many checks for ten pounds payable to the Ritz Hotel you wrote out between May the 5th and May the 10th. He gave a kind of gulp. Reggie, he said, you're a genius. I've always said so. I believe you've got it. Hold the line. Presently he came back again. Hello, he said. I'm here, I said. It was the 8th. Reggie, old man, I... Topping, I said. Good night. It was working along into the small hours now, but I thought I might as well make a night of it and finish the thing up, so I rang up an hotel near the Strand. Put me through to Mrs. Cardew, I said. It's late, said the man at the other end. And getting later every minute, I said. Buck along, laddie. I waited patiently. I had missed my beauty sleep, and my feet had frozen hard, but I was past regrets. "'What is the matter?' said Mary's voice. "'My feet are cold,' I said, "'but I didn't call you up to tell you that particularly. "'I've just been chatting with Bobby, Mrs. Cardew. "'Oh, is that Mr. Pepper?' "'Yes. He's remembered it, Mrs. Cardew.' "'She gave a sort of scream. 
I have often thought how interesting it must be to be one of those exchange girls. The things they must hear, don't you know? Bobby's howl and gulp and Mrs. Bobby's scream and all about my feet and all that. Most interesting it must be. He's remembered it, she gasped. Did you tell him? No. Well, I hadn't. Mr. Pepper? Yes. Was he... has he been... was he very worried? I chuckled. This was where I was billed to be the life and soul of the party. Worried? He was about the most worried man between here and Edinburgh. He has been worrying as if he was paid to do it by the nation. He has started out to worry after breakfast, and... Oh, well, you can never tell with women. My idea was that we should pass the rest of the night slapping each other on the back across the wire, and telling each other what bally brainy conspirators we were, don't you know, and all that. But I would got just as far as this when she bit at me. Absolutely. I heard the snap. And then she said, Oh, in that choked kind of way. And when a woman says, Oh, like that, it means all the bad words she loved to say, if she only knew them. And then she began. What brutes men are! What horrible brutes! How could you stand by and see poor dear Bobby worrying himself into a fever, when a word from you would have put everything right? I can't, but, and you call yourself his friend, his friend! Metallic laugh, most unpleasant. It shows how one can be deceived. I used to think you a kind-hearted man. But, I say, when I suggested the thing you thought it perfectly, I thought it hateful, abominable. But you said it was absolutely top. I said nothing of the kind, and if I did, I didn't mean it. I don't wish to be unjust, Mr. Pepper, but I must say that to me there seems to be something positively fiendish in a man who could go out of his way to separate a husband from his wife, simply in order to amuse himself by gloating over his agony. But when one single word would have, but you made me promise not to, I bleated. And if I did, do you suppose I didn't expect you to have the sense to break your promise? I had finished. I had no further observations to make. I hung up the receiver and crawled into bed. I still see Bobby when he comes to the club, but I do not visit the old homestead. He is friendly, but he stops short of issuing invitations. I ran across Mary at the academy last week, and her eyes went through me like a couple of bullets through a pat of butter, and as they came out the other side, and I limped off to piece myself together again, there occurred to me the simple epitaph which, when I am no more, I intend to have inscribed on my tombstone. It was this. He was a man who acted from the best motives. There is one born every minute. End of Absent Treatment